so at this point, I'm going to ask the town administrator uh, to please read the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, we'll amend or approve the agenda and then a period of public comment. And then on the consent agenda is the first item and it has the payroll warrant, the select board meeting dates of April 1st, April 10th is the advisory hearing, April 15th and April 29th, and police chief search committee meeting dates of March 25th, April 8th, and April 22nd. The second item is a 7.15 p.m. public hearing of transfer of liquor license with Sherburn Wine and Spirits. Item three is COVID-19 team update. Number four is consideration of various appointments. Cable TV Advisory Board, Doug Ambos for a three-year term to expire on June 15th, 2024. Traffic Safety Committee, Susan Tyler for a one-year term to expire June 15th, 2022. Brian Clark for a three-year term to expire June 15th, 2024. Douglas Peterson for a three-year term to expire June 15th, 2024. Uh, under item five, it's all town meeting related. Um, 2021 annual town meeting warrant articles. Uh, Board of Assessors adopt law allowing assessors to collect tax data until June 30th. Board of Assessors revaluation funding request to withdraw from warrant. Planning board consideration to add a warrant article to accept an easement for Upper Charles Trail Connector. And then capital items for FY 2022 discussion and consideration. The items are turf field at Laurel Farms with David Goldberg Recreation Department. Uh, command vehicle and hose replacement, Zach Ward, Fire Chief. Police Department cruisers, Interim Chief David Bento. Uh, Non-road equipment, Sean Colleen, DPW Director. Road work equipment, Sean Colleen, DPW Director. One ton truck, Sean Colleen, DPW Director. Roadway management, Sean Colleen, DPW Director. Pine Hill Access Road and campus improvements, Sean Colleen, DPW Director. Woodhaven Leland Farms Public Water Supply Improvements, Sean Colleen, DPW Director. 5C, it's FY 2022 omnibus budgets <coughs> board discussion and consideration of select board budgets FY 22 prior to advisory hearings. Item six, discussion of interim finance director. Number seven is consideration of routine business select board reports and continuance of goals review and town administrator and staff report. And that's it. Very good. Um, now, if it's okay with the board, um, I would like to actually, since the uh, public hearing, uh, agenda item two, public hearing 715, um, I think we'll get there before 715, but you cannot start before that. I'd like to move um, the COVID team update um, ahead of that, essentially switch, sw swap two and three. Probably that. Makes sense. Okay. Do I have a motion relative to the agenda? Move to approve the agenda. As adjusted. Yep. As, As adjusted. Yeah. Uh, second. Second. Okay, all in favor, George? Aye. Jeff? Aye. And Paul. Now, in the public okay. comment, I have a request um, from Jeff Waldron to make a statement at uh, public comment. Uh, the floor is yours, Jeff. Thanks, Eric. So I think as most of you know, um, I'm on the also a member of the Dover Sherburn COVID um, virus team. And so I'm going to make a public service announcement today that came up uh, as a result of our joint COVID team discussions this week. And it's about uh, contact tracing. So the, I'm making this annou announcement to encourage all Sherburn residents to be fully cooperative and forthright with our public health nurse contact tracers who are working tirelessly to limit the spread of COVID-19 virus in our communities. We've had a lot of pushback, not just in Sherburn, all all over contact tracers. Believe me, it's not a, an easy job. Be kidding me. So um, if you test positive for COVID-19, a contract tracer is gonna reach out to you. There's a state run uh, database called Maven that tracks all positive cases. And um, we really wanna encourage people to answer the calls and to re respond to text messages from all the contact tracers. Um, the contract taster is going to ask who your close contacts are, uh, but they keep that um, entirely confidential. And they're doing that um, to track 
any infectious spread during that period. Now, what, what we encounter is some people are afraid to reveal the names of their contacts because they don't want people to know that they have COVID. However, the contact tracer, as I said, does not uh, disclose your identity whatsoever. They contact all of the um, identified contacts of a positive case uh, and they tell them that they were possibly exposed on a specific date, but they don't get any information about the location of the exposure the time of day or the person who may have inadvertently exposed them. Um, so the rationale for contact tracing is letting those close contacts know that they may have been exposed so they can quarantine right away and then get tested to identify whether or not um, they became infected from the exposure. If people don't cooperate with the contact tracing, then their contacts just go about their usual business and they can spread the virus throughout the community. So it, it's really essential that, you know, to help keep Sherburne safe that we support our contact tracers. And um, they sometimes get a lot of pushback. So I hope hopefully anyone that hears this and um, is sympathetic, I would encourage you to, to respect what they're doing and help them as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. That is important. Absolutely. Um, okay. Is there a, uh, what do we have left here? Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Thank you. Second. <laughs> okay. All in favor. George? Aye. Yeah. Aye. Paul? Aye. I might as well. Okay. Off to modified number two, which is the uh, COVID team update. And just so people know, um, Zach is actually assisting another town with a fire right now. He will not be speaking, obviously, tonight. Uh, but I believe Daryl is here. Yes, and would I be able to uh, share my screen? Is that all right with you? Yeah, maybe, maybe you might have to. Uh, I don't know if you should do a broadly uh, allow share, but maybe uh, assign her as uh, what's it called host. Yeah, she's okay. I'll just I'll just do it and undo it. That's easier. You should be all set, Daryl. All right. Let me make this larger. Probably be helpful. Are you able to read it? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to highlight how beautifully our seniors are demonstrating <laughs> the right way to go. You see that they are uh, over 95% have had their first dose and wow. quite a few have already had the second dose. That's so great. we're doing very well on that. Now we have had an uptick in cases just in the last few days. Uh, so we were, we were actually at zero cases a day for a little bit, but we're going back up again. And that's really, it sounds like you have a completely full agenda, so I'm not going to take any more time now. The graphs that sometimes I show, those will be posted on the website. Jeannie's been putting them up. Um, Daryl, can I ask you a question? Created. Daryl? Excuse me, yes. Can I ask you a quick question? How do you do, do um, how do you get the information of who's had doses and like do the when people get a shot, does it get automatically reported to the their town's board of health or uh, no, actually that is confidential. This information that I'm displaying is off of the state website and you oh, okay. can find this for every single town in Massachusetts. Yeah, I was just curious how, how that, that data was was found. That's great. Yes, and there's uh, there are more columns in this. It goes on of how many who, who have had both doses and some other statistics, I was, so. I was curious about the um, kind of that similar thing reporting, not so much on the um, immunizations, but even the positives. He said there's a recent uptick. So, yes. I mean, I, I had a COVID test done like a week ago and uh, I came back negative. If that came back positive, does that automatically get reported to you? It goes into MAVEN and the Board of Health, you have to be uh, certified by the state to look at MAVEN. I cannot look at MAVEN. And that's what the database that Jeff referred to earlier. Okay. Uh, but the Board of Health Administrator and our public health nurses can access that, but I never know the identity of anybody or so. Okay. It's, uh, 
is confidential information. Uh, okay. One thing that we're a bit concerned in with the numbers going up, this was also part of our discussion this morning at the joint Dover Shore Board meeting, is that with uh, about a little over 25% of the Massachusetts population vaccinated now, infection should be going down. So when we're seeing a rise in cases, it tends to be, you know, it'll be in the unvaccinated group. More likely, doesn't mean that vaccinated people can't be infected, but to actually be tested means you, you have symptoms or some other reason to be tested. Uh, so we're a bit concerned about what that might mean in terms of less precautionary behaviors from the opening up and that more younger people are getting it, potentially. So just something that we're trying mm -hmm. to keep an eye on. And I assume the state is also keeping an eye on that. Okay, very good. Um, okay. Any questions from the select board? No. How about from the general public? Any questions on public? And I'll put on my participants. So if you use your raise hand, whatever it is, your virtual raise hand, I wish we will see it. Okay, it doesn't look okay. good. Thank well, you. thank you very much, Daryl. Thank you for this. I have got three minutes to the public hearing. Do you want to make some quick appointments? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. Can I make a motion to appoint Doug Ambos to the Cable TV Advisory Board? So moved. Second. Second. All right. That's it. Um, all in favor, George? Aye. Jeff? Aye. Paul? Aye. I am I as well. Very good. Congratulations, Doug, if you're on here. And uh, now I make a motion to appoint Susan Tyler for the Traffic Safety Committee. Susan Tyler for a term to expire June 15th, 2022. Brian Clark for a term to expire June 15th, 2024. And Doug Peterson for a th three year term to expire June 15th, 2024. Second. I moved and seconded. Uh, all in favor, George? Aye. Uh, Jeff? Aye. Paul? Aye. I am I as well. All right, 713. Wow, we're too efficient. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to slow, slow down the way we uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> No, it's very good. Um, all right. I don't know if there's any uh, business that anyone wants to discuss just for a minute or two. Look like it. All right. I'm going to call it 715. I think 71430. So I'd like to uh, begin the uh, um, the public hearing. Let me get my background material on this. Is uh, Jeannie speaking to this? Am I speaking for this? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, I get, I, here we have uh, Sherman Wine and Spirits is being sold to the Patels and I think I saw them on. Hello, mm -hmm. welcome. Hi, hi. Um, they have all their paperwork. Uh, they got, Dave Bento said that they are fine. They, we asked just as what we do. Um, so that came back today. It was advertised in the paper. All the abutters were notified. So the only thing, if you have questions to ask them, um, that's great. And other than that, if you approve it, there's a form that you all have to sign. And uh, just administratively, is uh, uh, we have so much time to sign that. Like, will that be available tomorrow if we all stop by one by yeah, one? That's fine. Okay. That's fine. Okay, very good. Uh, any questions from the board? Questions for the applicant. Looks no, like I we I, I'm wondering if they could just introduce themselves and maybe say, you know, if they've run a similar businesses elsewhere, or just a quick overview. Um, Eric, I see Matthew Porter is raising his hand. If you want to, yeah, I see. I saw. I'm, first, I'm taking questions from the board, then I'll take it from the general public. So, if you guys, I don't know if you, uh, Matthew, are you I'm, a representative? I'm the attorney of record. That's what I got. Oh, okay, okay. I thought it was <laughs> a question. So I'd be happy just to give the board just an overview of the transaction, if it, if it's so please. Okay, absolutely. Great. Please do. Uh, so, my name is Matthew Porter. I'm the attorney for Keshav Das Inc., um, who is the applicant before you. Uh, the corporation is purchasing Sherborn Wine and Spirits. Uh, with me today is Milan Patel uh, and Tejas Patel. Uh, they're the two shareholders of the corporation. Um, Milan would also be 
uh, the proposed manager on the license as well. So uh, very experienced operators. They own a store together in Framingham uh, that has been very successful for a few years now. Uh, and this is an opportunity to, to buy into uh, the wonderful town of Sherborne. So certainly uh, understand the experience uh, and the responsibilities that come along with operating a license. Um, and certainly with that, I can answer any questions that the board may have. My clients can as well. I would say the only thing that is not out of the ordinary, but that we would point out is there is a pledge of the license to uh, Rockland Trust. Uh, Rockland Trust is financing the transaction. So essentially they, they take a pledge um, of that license as well. So that's something that the board would need to need to approve along with the transfer of the license. Okay, very good. Um, I got, so which, uh, which store do you open uh, own in Framingham? Uh, we own the Nopsco Wine and Spirits uh, that's on Agile Road. Okay. Right, going towards Sudbury. Yep. Yep. And I also own a convenience store that's uh, on Irving Street in Framingham. I have few customers that come from Sherborne, so I know it. I saw one of them up here in the Zoom meeting, so it's probably I can't me. I recognize her, but I don't probably. know the name. So <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, we're, we're Eric, happy. you don't spend any time in Framingham, right? <laughs> uh, I'm gonna apologize. I'm gonna apologize in advance for uh, this summer's construction in Knobscott, by the way. <laughs> no, I <know>. That's true. <laughs> we were actually on the Zoom meeting before this with them. No, I know. That's why I couldn't attend it. But anyway. yeah. um, okay. Uh, any other questions, I guess, from the board? Now, one thing I would just like to say, I'd like to um, acknowledge, I see Catherine Coughlin's on here. Um, just want to say thank you to Catherine as being a good business. I know she's selling the store, but I think she's been a great community member. And I just want to say thank you for the time and effort that she's put into running a great business in town and, and just wanted to say thank you. I, I couldn't agree more. Catherine has been a great stakeholder, uh, been very engaged with uh, the community and very engaged. Um, you know, everything from being a next door to coming on these meetings, uh, going to other public hearings with the, the Board of Health. And yeah, I would like definitely like to thank Catherine. Um, okay, if there's nothing else, uh, I, um, and it, uh, I asked before, but confirm, any other comments from the general public, the public in general? Just a hearing. Sure, okay. Chuck, Chuck, Chuck has a comment. I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be brief on because I want to just echo what George said. Um, Chuck, do you still not use the virtual hands? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Catherine has been terrific. Besides having great taste in wine, the uh, Sherburn Business Association has just done great stuff for the town, and she's been integral in that. And the um, uh, it, it's important to be supportive of businesses in town, and that's including helping them with exit strategies. So. Um, yeah. I, I, I think it's important to approve this and to thank Catherine for all of her uh, years and contributions to the town. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Looks like there's no further comments from the general public. Uh, and motion relative to this hearing. Well, I move that we approve the transfer of the liquor license of Sherburn Wine and Spirits. Very good. Thank you. Okay. Um, all in favor, George. Aye. Jeff. Aye. Uh, Paul. Aye. I am I as well. All right. Good luck and uh, welcome, to, could, welcome to Sherburn. I, yeah. I, I do need the board to just approve the, the Pledge of License as well, just for oh. statement. You know, oh, okay. A motion relative to the Pledge of License. I'll, I'll make the motion that it, to approve the uh, assignment of the liquor license to Rockland. You said Rockland Trust? Yes, sir. Yes. Yep. Second. Okay. Uh, all in favor, George? Aye. Jeff? Aye. Paul? Aye. I might as well. I Eric, think it's... Susie Tyler has her hand up. Oh, yeah. yeah iPad 3. Yeah, iPad 3. What do you have to say? <laughs> <laughs> iPad 3. Um, uh, yeah, when does this take effect as far as do we have time to get down there and buy another bottle of wine and say goodbye? Or this effect of now? It takes about a month for the state to approve the license. So you get some time. Okay, cool. Not that I drink wine. <laughs> <laughs> I do. All right. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Thank and very uh, much. Uh, as Jeannie, um, you'll be around tomorrow and we can uh, stop by one by one. Okay, that's okay. what we'll do. Okay. Have a great evening. Congratulations. Jeannie, I'll be in touch. I don't know when I'll be able to get in, but I will. i am got a new job and I'm not around town very much. So I will. Not going uh, anywhere. 
So right. whatever. <laughs> I'll get there as soon as I can. Okay. Okay, it takes us right on to the town meeting um, our um, agenda items. Very good. So I'll begin with um, agenda 5A, uh, 2021 annual town meeting warrant articles. Uh, the first one by, from the Board of Assessors, to adopt a law allowing assessors to collect tax data until June 30th. Um, can't find the material on this. Who's on, who's speaking on this one? Wendy, Wendy's on here. Wendy's on here? Yes. Oh, there she is. Now you, Wendy. Good evening, Wendy Alassi, Director of Assessing. Um, this is a, it's chapter 653, section 40, an act of 1989. It will allow the assessor to collect new improvements, construction and data, um, construction improvements until June 30, ver rather than June, uh, January 1st. So for example, I, got a list of properties from January till last week from the building inspector. And we have approximately $5 million in value right now that if this is not adopted, will not go on the tax rolls for another year. Um, so by doing this, it will allow us to tax as of July 1st, rather than waiting till the following July. Um, what it will also do is allow us to start with supplemental billing and supplemental billing will be, for example, if, you, if a home receives an occupancy permit and they purchase the property for $750,000, the taxes, would be 14,722. You divide that and you get a per diem rate. And the per diem rate for that would be $40.34. Then you calculate the number of days that they've been in Sherburne. We're going to say 90 days. You take the 90 days times the $40.34. And in the spring, we send a supplemental bill for $3,630. And then beginning July 1, they will start receiving a full tax bill. So it's a, a benefit to the town. Okay, very good. Uh, any questions from the board? Well, just a comment. Yeah, go, Paul. Uh, first of all, it's, it's a no brainer article, and I'm going to support it, but I, I don't like the way the article's written. It's written in technical language and doesn't tell the voters what it really means. And what it means is that we can pick up value increases, not just from the regular assessment date of January 1, but through the end of the year. I'd like to see those words put in here so the voters know what they're voting on. So Paul, could I, if, if I can just take one minute. Um, originally I had constructed um, an article and then I had it reviewed and it came back as the one that you're looking at. Um, could I read the article that I propose because I feel it gives a much clearer um, description of, of what people are um, voting on? Would that be okay? And you guys can tell me if you think it makes sense to well, maybe that, change it. That's fine. It's just because I'm a lawyer, I know that when I see a lawyer's written article, Sometimes make sense. lawyers make things more obscure, and I think that's the case here. So it's, yes. I'm not faulting anybody. I, I just sure. think it's yep. so obscure that a voter looking at this, trying to decide, should I go to town meeting? Shouldn't I go to town meeting? We'll have no idea what this is really about. So I completely agree. So let me propose the original one, because I feel it's more layman. So it's assessment on new construction and improvements of real property, chapter 653. I'm sorry? I think just a, a, a random sound came, but came across. Oh, okay. There's somebody who's okay. not muted, I think. Yeah. Okay, so chapter 653, section 40, acts of 1989, allows communities that accept its provisions to assess new buildings, structures, or other physical improvements added to real property between January and June for the upcoming fiscal year. As a result, new construction or improvements built on a parcel 
during the first six months of the year will now be reflected in the assessed valuation of the parcel a fiscal year earlier. The legislation reduces the delay that occurs between the construction and taxation of new buildings and other improvements to real estate. I like that much better. And that's what should be inserted, I think, into the, the town meeting booklet, essentially. You know, there's the official okay. language, there's the explanation. I think that's what really matters. Excellent. That, Good. That that's something you can work on with advisory. So it's in maybe the advisory report that I know mm -hmm. the town council really kind of dictates how the article has to be written. But if we have the layman's terms in the advisory report, then people will better understand it. Yes, yes. And unfortunately, well, fortunately and unfortunately, um, my son is graduating from college on May 15th. Um, so I will need to find somebody to present the article and I will give them the, this additional information because I think it explains it well. Um, so if anybody has any other questions, I'm finished. I just have one other thing um, when I'm finished with this. Actually, here's a point uh, maybe for David. I mean, some, um, are we voting on these? This isn't a request for sponsorship. Is this a request for the select board to sponsor? We vote and we officially sponsor now? This is whether we support it. Right. Okay. So it's a vote to support. Okay. You so vote. Vote. Do you want to vote individually on each one of these or at the end? I guess maybe on each one of these uh, uh, three proposed under, under uh, agenda item 5A. Oh. Well, I think we should do each one, perhaps since they're different topics, but should we, we've already approved the warrant, correct? And now we're reviewing and looking at this. So do we have to open the warrant to modify the language as we just suggested Wendy should do? I mean, the uh, language is no, already in the, the warrant. No. No? No. Um, that can, they can change the, the wording of the warrant? Yeah, I did, um, I did get an uh, opinion from Chris Petrini that that as long as something existed before that I can move it between capital or an article or change the words. Okay. We should, but there's sort of different topics. I sort of feel like we should do each one individually. Yeah, okay. I agree. That, particularly since the next one looks like we might have to actually modify the warrant or yeah. I don't know. Well, yeah. anyway, but let's, let's take a vote relative to this. There's a motion relative to this item. I move that I we move accept the, the revision to the uh, Board of Assessors uh, adopting a, a new law for the tax collection date. I think it's more of a, Jeff, you move to support the article. I move to support the article uh, related right. to tax assessors, tax collection date. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay. Okay, all in favor, George? Aye. Jeff? Aye. Paul? Aye. I am I as well. Okay, when you're still on for the next one, and um, I guess there's a request to withdraw something from the warrant. Yes, um, so I came forward with a warrant article to request funding for our FY23 revaluation. I met with advisory and they recommended that they just put it, uh, they add it to my budget instead. So they're doing half this year and half, uh, half for fiscal 22 and half for fiscal 23, rather than having to make it a warrant article because it's it almost an unfunded mandate, if you will. There's no reason, I mean, for us to even discuss it because she has to do it. <laughs> there's, no, there's no discussion to be had. Okay, right. I don't think the article should be withdrawn. Let me explain why. Yeah. You put something in a budget, at the end of the year, it's gone and goes to free cash. If you put it in a warrant article, by definition, it's available in subsequent years. So all my other towns, when they have articles like this, have an appropriation in a warrant article that accumulates over three, four, five years sometimes, each having a percentage of the total expenditure. So when you get to the end, all that money is still there rather than reverting to free cash. You, you can't uh, uh, put an item in an operating budget and then expect it to be around in future years. So I don't think this is a good idea. I think advisory discussed this the other night and by splitting it up between the two years, that's gonna make it work. And it, you don't want the opportunity for, the, what happens if the voters voted down, Paul? and you, they say, no, we're not gonna spend the money on revaluations, even though the state says we have to do it. 
that doesn't make any sense. I think if you split it up as Wendy and advisory are proposing, that makes more sense. It should be split up. I'm in agreement with splitting it up, but that has but to it be- It doesn't done. need to be a warrant article. It does, because then it won't stay from one fiscal year to the next. Well, let me ask this, Wendy, how often don't we do it? Like, is it every three years or every five years that we redo? Yes. Yeah, so it, it was triennial and historically um, we would do a warrant article and we would go to town meeting. Um, and when I brought this forward, I was questioned as to why. And I said, just as Paul said, because it, it rolls from year to year. Um, what advisory said, and I already spoke with Patriot Property, is um, if we just build it into your budget for 22 and build it into your budget for 23, you'll have 8,000 for this year and 8,000 for the next year. And Patriot Property was perfectly fine. And that the timing of the work would make sense as well. Um, so I did speak with them, but I understand what Paul is, is saying too. So essentially you guys can make a decision as to how you want to move forward. Well, one thing that strikes <laughs> me is, so it's basically something that's in your budget periodically, basically at different amounts, depending on when the reassessment period is. If you think of how the elections budget is run, it's the same thing in years when we have like you know, a special election or a presidential election, the election expenses are higher in some years than other years. So their budget goes up and down in a somewhat predictable way, but it's the same kind of thing. And the budget is higher. It's not a nonlinear budget cycle basically, is what I'm saying. So it seems like that's the same here to me. Jeff, can I just interrupt for a second? Can somebody mute? There's I hear, there's a lot of background noise going on. And I think there's some people that aren't speaking. Let me look, let me look. I'll, 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 I'll see if I can find it. Okay, thank you. If you're not speaking, there's no, you can be muted. Or, if you, thank you. So based on what she's saying, if, if, if the vendor will take a, a payment early in this fiscal year and the second half of the payment in a subsequent year, then the problem's solved? Okay. Yeah. But, so I'm gonna withdraw the objection this time, but Many times when you have like a five year period, my towns will do 20% a year and never an operating budget. They'll put it into a warrant article. So over the space of five years, you don't have to pay the vendor 20% five years in advance or 10 years in advance. You can pay it when you need it. The money is there. It's a much cleaner and better way to go. So why don't but, we explore that for the now for the 2028? Uh, you know, I mean, we can we can do it that way. And I understand what you're saying, because most communities do it just like you're saying. Yes, um, it's so standard way things are done and here. Sherburn is being different, but it's, it's great that the vendor will take payment in an earlier fiscal year. That's that's wonderful. I take payment yeah. myself in an earlier fiscal year than someone's willing to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but that that solves the problem but I, I, I think long term it's not a good practice to do it this way but i'm withdrawing the objection because the vendor is accommodating okay okay like is there a motion relative to support this also I think we're moving to withdraw it so we have to yeah so we have to open the the, this and, and the next one it looks like you might have to open the war and open the yeah. Is there anything procedurally to that? I mean, it's not on the agenda to open the warrant, but this this is on the agenda. Is there anything procedural? Do we have to actually have another meeting where we actually open it, do it, vote these two things in? And David, around? to me, when I talked to Chris Petrini and, and Paul, it's, it's I'm not sure how it's done in your communities, but uh, Chris had said that we could, if we were dropping off an article, we can take it off and make, the changes to the warrant however we want it as long as the board is voting that final warrant of, of you know and no changes done after that um that's a little different than how i've handled it in the past but it seemed to be okay in a way of not opening and closing the warrant but what are your thoughts on that I, I see a hand up, but Paul, do you have any thoughts on that before I take a... I, I'm, I'm not going to... I mean, you've got a town council, so yeah. I'm... 
Probably. <laughs> okay. Uh, Sean, do you have a comment? You're muted, Sean. You're good. How's that? Better. Hey, better. Apologies. I thought it was clear we, we had to open it because that next item, and then I have one, although I'm dropping, I dropped two off the warrant, but we gained one. We're, I mean, we're essentially renaming one of them, but I thought it was clear we were opening and closing it tonight. You're going to need it for that planning board article. It's well, not um, on the agenda for opening and closing the warrant and revoting it. That's so I don't think you, by doing it, you aren't adding anything to it if it wasn't even added on the agenda. But um, to add a new article would, yeah, you would have to open and close it. But if it's something that exists on this warrant or this checklist, it's been put there for quite a while. So which well, one are you saying? Is there's two things that didn't. The next one. Next one as well, which we'll talk about in a minute. Well, let's let's. Here's my suggestion. We have an opinion from town council that what we're the way we're uh, proceeding is fine. We can do some homework this next week or whatever. And if we have to do a cleanup next next week and just make some kind of open and close vote or whatever else, we can do right. that. We can have our discussion now. But I'm assuming the mo um, if someone makes a motion relative to this one, it'll basically be consistent. A request to withdraw, uh, you know, support. I mean, it wouldn't be support. Actually, would would actually vote to withdraw this article from the current warrant. I guess that's what this would be. Right, because we can take things off the warrant. I think it's a, we have to open it to put things in. Which okay. we have both. We have a couple right. of each. So but I think I think maybe it makes sense to, like you said, Eric, before our next meeting, yeah. make sure like maybe we plan on putting an agenda item on our next meeting to open and close the warrant. Yeah. So then, you know, if there's anything else that comes up, there's the planning board one. We can do it then. We can talk about it tonight, but then be ready to do it and just have it as a clear agenda item that we're opening and closing the warrant. And I would still actually take a vote tonight because just in case it is appropriate, I don't think it hurts, certainly not. Yes. And you can also maybe, maybe our agenda item in two weeks will be like to support the votes of last week or whatever. But mm -hmm. you know, if, if you know, if, uh, if, it, if Chris is consistent with that and it's you know, clear from him, I would still recommend a, a vote relative to this tonight. Okay. So there's a motion relative to removing this uh, warrant article. From the current one moved. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor, George. Aye. Jeff. Aye. Uh, Paul. Aye. I'm I as well. Okay. So next up is a planning board uh, consideration to add a warrant article to accept an easement for the Upper Charles Trail connector. I'm assuming, Gino, since you turned your camera on, that you're speaking for this. Yes. Right. Um, as you might remember, when uh, Whitney Farm Development was originally approved by ZBA, there was a requirement for a, an easement to connect from Whitney Street to, over to the Upper Charles Trail. It included some parking spaces. Over the years, we've expanded that easement so that the trail can now connect at the gas line crossing as opposed to closer to Whitney, the Whitney Street Bridge like it was originally intended. And that does a couple of things. It's it's a much uh, softer grade to get down to the to gas line easement, and it's very muddy, and um, you know it's it's a less desirable spot right now uh, at that earlier earlier part. The the contract now has been uh, awarded, and the construction is about to start. So we need to have uh, an easement in place to uh, authorize us to do work on the private property. Okay, makes sense to me. Uh, any questions from the board? Any questions from the general public? Seeing none, a motion relative to this? So moved because this is a no brainer. Yeah. Again, we're getting land. Yeah. And it's gonna be for handicap use and make it easier for people to use the trail. How, how much of a no brainer do we need? So yeah, I move that we- Second. All right, um, all in favor, George? Aye. Jeff? Aye. Paul? Aye. I might as well. Okay, that case here I have on agenda item 5A. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 5B, capital items for FY22 for discussion and consideration. Number one, I believe we have some pretty extensive background material on this here. Uh, the turf field at Lauren Farms. David Goldberg from the uh, Recreation Department. Are you on the call here somewhere? Yes, I am. Oh, there you are. I wish my Zoom made it so if your camera's on, you automatically pop up front, but it doesn't do that. So. 
Um, yes, Dave, go ahead. In fact, um, do you have a presentation or uh, is it just a I do. I just, I mean, I can take this any way you want. I suppose, I don't know, David, do we start with whether or not this gets switched to a Warren article? I'm um, talking to town council on Monday. Um, we, they advise that we, uh, we remove this from the capital request uh, table and uh, and actually create a Warren article, which is I think is where it started. Um, well, we've done so this already. We've already made that adjustment in the warrant. Okay, so we're all set. So we're that's so, everyone's aware of that then. So Dave, why don't you make your presentation? Can Jeff? Can you allow him to share his screen because he has a yeah. PowerPoint that? I know. I watched it last night. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, well, it's going to be a lot of the same then. You should be good, Dave. Yeah. All right, great. So I'll try and go through this somewhat quickly uh, so that I don't spend too much time on stuff that uh, maybe isn't all that relevant. So essentially, um, the rec committee has been discussing this for a number of years, and I think people have been in town for a while. I uh, know that, this, that a project similar to this, probably with a slightly larger scope uh, was considered years ago. Um, but uh, I thought we'd go through just the motivation of why we're looking at this project. Um, certainly uh, the grass fields we have today uh, have inconsistent play. Uh, during the summer, they can get pretty, be pretty hard. Um, they can't be used after rain. Uh, and essentially during early parts of the season, um, they're unusable. So because we're waiting for the grass to germinate and for the, the ground to uh, get a little harder uh, so that right now, if we had, um, you know, kids that wanted to get out and practice, they wouldn't be able to. Um, likewise, there are times when we want to rotate the fields. We want to ensure that we, we are uh, maintaining the grass fields as much as possible, uh, as higher as high a quality as possible. Um, and sometimes that's not that's not an option, given that we, you know, we have a high demand for those fields. Uh, and as part of this project, we're looking at improving the parking over there. If anyone's been over there, they're very familiar with the fact that it uh, can kind of be a free for all at times. Uh, and one of the guiding sort of principles for the whole project was to make it uh, cost neutral to the town of Sherburne and its taxpayers, but also to ensure that we didn't have to go out and raise prices for our youth organizations uh, and talking to them, you know, they already, I think, are one of the highest in the state in terms of what the, what it costs to play sports. Uh, so we didn't want to necessarily have to pay, uh, or I should say, um, pass those those uh, costs on to them. Um, and generally, if, if things work out for us, it should actually provide uh, a bit of revenue to recreation, which we can use for uh, a lot of other projects and some of the deferred maintenance that we've had uh, throughout some of the facilities. Uh, the proposal is to uh, two full-size soccer fields uh, made out of synthetic turf. Uh, they'll be located on the northeast side and essentially be used by any sport. The idea is that they'll be lined for various sports. Uh, we're seeing an uptick in field hockey, um, but lacrosse, soccer, baseball, rugby, you name it, um, should be able to use it. There'll be no seam between the two fields, so they'll be contiguous, uh, so we can use them in any direction. Um, and that provides a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of how we leverage them. Uh, additionally, a uh, significant number of parking spaces, um, some equipment uh, to maintain the fields, as well as a shed to be put over at Laurel um, for equipment and, uh, and other stuff. And then assuming we've got some material left over, we would use that to grade some of the natural fields to help with some of the low spots and, uh, and, and drainage there. This is uh, the rendering uh, of the fields. So you can see there where they're located, uh, the improvements to the parking lot. Um, you can't quite see it, it's, it's small, but um, there's a storage shed here, which we've talked about putting down in the corner, but you can see the relative size of the storage shed compared to uh, the overall facility. Whoops, let me go back. Uh, probably the question we get the most is, how are we gonna pay for it? Um, so we spent, as a rec committee, we spent a lot of time looking at the numbers and uh, essentially backed into the number <coughs> of a million that you see in front of you that we're looking to borrow. Uh, it was based off of what we felt was, was the cash flow we would get from the fields that we felt we could comfortably pay back uh, to the town over time. So the idea here is that it would be um, money that was borrowed, but certainly paid back, um, similar to 
uh, what Woodhaven did, which is essentially to borrow the money and use the revenue that it generates to, to pay it back. So again, the idea is not to pass the, the burden of it onto the, the uh, Sherbert taxpayers. So of the 4 million, approximate 4 million cost, the goal is to go out and raise the, raise the balance between the million that we would potentially borrow from the town, um, which would be about 3 million from private donors. And in terms of, if we borrowed a million from the town, we expect the bond to be somewhere. I, <laughs> Heidi told me to up my numbers. I think when we started this it was about 2%. Uh, it's higher now, but I don't see any, any issue with us covering a higher percentage rate, but assuming that we had to pay back $150,000 a year for 10 years, um, we've, you know, we've gone out, we've talked to other towns in terms of the number of hours that they lease their fields, um, what they get for a similar field, and um, come out with, with revenue projections in terms of what we would have to pay off the, the bond amount. And I have all sorts of numbers to back this up. I've got tables if you wanna go through them, um, but I'll, I guess I'll stop there and see if there are any questions before I bore you with all the numbers that we use that sort of back up the, uh, the numbers that you see here on the screen. Yeah, I got some questions. questions. <clears throat> yeah, Paul, was that you? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first, I wanna urge you to do a separate article on this. It, right now, in the, at least the version I have, it's just listed as a capital item. It's not really, just a capital item. There's a capital item in there, but you also have this operation going forward of uh, raising uh, funds through rental fees and so on. Oh, it's already been changed to a warrant article. It hasn't on the one I got with the package. Well, he well he said it at the very beginning. David confirmed that they've already switched it to a warrant. And David, have you shared that out with everybody? Not with me. The new language. No, I had just e I had just done it, Dave, and emailed <laughs> you to approve it. So I'm updating the warrant and going to uh, send it out to them. But yeah, that so was, there is language to explain a little bit of the details around the borrowing structure. Yeah, that, that was not like that. that was not a change to the article. That was a change to the motion with the details in the motion. And even if the standalone article, I'm assuming it's still a two thirds vote, correct? Because it's going to be bonded. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But let me let me just finish. So I had two comments. The first was it needed a, a separate uh, article, standalone. The the second urged that result. The second uh, was that I was on the board at the time when we discussed the earlier version of this project, and there was considerable opposition from the abutters. So I'm urging you to uh, make contact with the abutters and discuss the plans with them specifically. For example, one of the big issues was whether or not there was going to be lights at night. And the feeling from a number of the abutters were that the lights were going to interfere with their enjoyment of their property. They would see it. It would completely change the character of where they live and so on and so on. I didn't see anything in here one way or the other about lights, but when I looked at the hours of operation, it kind of implies that there'd be lights so that you could have the hours to, to raise the dollars. So there are provisions of this plan that I feel need to be discussed with the abutters or history will repeat itself. <laughs> yeah, there are no lights in this plan. So if you look at, I, I flipped forward to um, our hours, uh, the hours that we backed into that 1200 hours per, per year. Um, and you can see in the summertime, we have rentals ending at eight o'clock because that's when the, that's as, as long as we can go in terms of sunlight uh, in the fall at six. So we have, we have no plans to put in lights as part of this project. Um, specifically because we knew that there were, you know, there are abutters and we want to be respectful of them. And, uh, and we knew that that's a potentially contentious topic. And really, we just want to take the use of the field as it is now and change it from the natural grass, which today doesn't have um, the amount of hours uh, or the consistency and essentially take the exact same fields today and, and, and uh, change them over to artificial turf. So 
but my point remains, I was just using that as an example. My point remains that having been involved in that, that uh, prior project and seeing the vehemence of the opposition, I'm urging you to have a meeting with the abutters and yeah. put on this, this uh, PowerPoint and answer their questions and address their concerns and urge you to be responsive to issues they feel need to be tweaked so that we don't have that history repeating itself here. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's a good point. I would echo Paul's comments because of environmental issues also in addition to the lights. I think George had a, George has well, just on, on Jeff's issue. I know Dave, Dave, do you want to speak? I know you've met with the board of health um, that, you know, that he's working with them on any environmental impacts these fields would have on drainage and that kind of thing. He's already, they're already in discussions with the board of health. Yeah. We had our first meeting with them. I was there. Yesterday. Okay. <laughs> and uh, there's, there's I, still a lot of discussion to go. I do have, I do have some comments. Um, I, I do applaud this. I, and I've just spoke, I've spoken to a lot of the youth sports organizations just because my, my daughters are part of them. Um, I think our town is woefully behind surrounding towns when it comes to competition, because we only have one turf field in both Dover and Sherburn and it's at the high school and they don't allow our youth youths to play on that field. It's only, it's restricted to only the high school use. Um, I think there's an opportunity here for our rec department to produce revenue for their department that's going to more than cover the debt service on this. I think it's going to provide a great opportunity to not only provide this service for all the families in town with their kids, but also raise additional money so they can add more pickleball courts or things that are going to help people that don't have kids playing these sports. I think this is a great thing for our recreation commission. I think Laurel Fields is a perfect location for it because as Paul said, the butters are a big concern. There's a lot of other fields that are surrounded by houses. Laurel doesn't have a ton of residences around, around it, which is kind of a nice, a nice uh, thing about it. And, and to be quite honest, Dave brought up the parking issue. I don't know how often any of you go into the Laurel Fields, but it's a dust bowl and potholes and the opportunity to fix the parking there along with this would be a godsend to every parent's vehicle in this town. Um, I really think we as a town should consider this, especially since it would be, they're not gonna build this until they raise enough money that, th that they would be borrowing a limited amount that would only be covered by their own revolving fund. It's not gonna cost the taxpayers anything and it's a way for the town to generate revenue and provide additional services to a lot of residents. I, have, so I, have, I actually have a question on that. And I certainly understand that this, um, you know, this be a uh, way called self-paying or whatever it is based on rentals and so on like that. And also pay for the maintenance, I'm sure. Um, is it possible to put some money away from escrow? Because eventually this will have a limited life and it'll somehow be demolished, removed or something like that. And at that point, frankly, the, no, maybe no one will care to some degree. Is a way to actually have some money in escrow to eventually demobilize and restore when uh, the lifespan 20, 30, 40 years of this thing is up? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, so you'll notice that from the revenue, we have about, I mean, approximately about 300,000 that we expect that we would bring in. Um, about, again, there's, there's somewhere between 120 and 150 in debt service. Um, about 120,000 of what's remaining needs to go into, um, I think it's gonna end up being a stabilization fund every year for 10 years to replace the field um, in, that, in that 10 year time frame. So we'll have about a million two approximately at the end of 10 years that, that we'll be putting away from the revenue that we take from the field leases. So we've, we've considered that. And then obviously <laughs> if you take the 300, you subtract the 150 and the 120, you know, then you get about to um, hopefully what what the rec department has as um, as additional cash that we can put to things like fixing the tennis court fence or upgrading the dugouts over at Laurel, things like that that we've been we've been thinking about doing for a while. Okay, very good. Um, I see Jeff Waldron is uh Jeff, your virtual hand is up. Do you have something? 
I know that you pressed that I figured out how to use my virtual hand. <laughs> so um, I, I'm going to counter the, counter the other arguments. I'm vehemently opposed to this project uh, on a whole host of reasons. One of which is the toxic materials used for fill. I know there's we heard, I've heard this full presentation last night, and it's a very good presentation. And there's a whole lot of choices on the fill material, some of which are more toxic than others. Um, but the one that's proposed is using basically ground up used tires, the rubber fill, rubber pellet fill, which I think is harmful players. I understand there's been some reduction of PFAS materials in it, but I believe it can also harm groundwater. A lot, a vast majority of the towns that have these fields do not get their water supply from the ground. They have public water supplies. So I'm opposed to it because of the toxic materials in the field. I'm opposed to it because there's a very high heat level. If it gets above 90 degrees, there have been reports in some communities of town of uh, uh, field temperatures over 160 degrees Fahrenheit. And so, and I think we heard that last night. You can correct me uh, if I'm mistaken, but there are periods of time in high heat where it cannot be used if the heat's over 90 degrees. Um, I don't like, we're having a problem environmentally with plastics in the ocean, so I don't like having these tiny particles of plastics adding to the environmental impact. In addition to the environmental waste 10 years down the road when you have to remove the turf itself and dispose of it and possibly the pad, but not definitely. And finally, the reason I'm opposed to it is a reason that's viewed as a benefit if you get these uh, fees for um, using the field. What my experience has been, that means it's people from outside town renting our fields. Uh, they're paying us for it and they're providing revenue, but it's not town, uh, it's not only town residents who are benefiting from the field and paying those fees. We'll have soccer clubs from Framingham and from everywhere else renting the field. It will give us revenue, but I don't, uh, I don't support this. And I, I look at this, if I'm reading this correctly, I thought the cost was a million dollars. If I'm reading this correctly, you say the cost is $4 million, $2 million per field. Imagine if we put $400,000 into redoing the grass and putting gravel under it and put natural grass over top of it and still have a natural surface. Um, Yes, there are. There pro I coached soccer in this town for 16 years, and I started both the men's and the women's lacrosse leagues in town. So I'm pretty knowledgeable about rescheduling games. But um, if we put the, a significant amount of money into natural grass, I think it's a better solution for the town. Thank you. Okay. Uh, George, you had a, a physical yeah, hand. Just, up. just a couple things on that. I mean, I, I respect your opinion on that, Jeff. Um, one thing, the, the private donations are a big part of this and that's coming from these youth sport leagues. I mean, my daughter, I know you coach soccer and lacrosse, my daughters play field hockey, which is a sport that is completely different on grass. No matter how good the grass is, it's never gonna be comparable to playing it on turf. So, so that's, that's, that's one thing. And I think soccer is a lot of different on turf than it is on grass um, on, on one part of it. Another thing is I've heard parents complaining, Laurel Fields is like playing on cement right now. So you talk about the health of the kids. I mean, is it healthy for the kids to be playing on a terrible surface that's, that's already at Laurel Fields? No, that's why I advocated. I don't think you're gonna get, I don't think you're gonna get $3 million in private donations to make it better grass. I, I, I wouldn't take that much, but Laurel Field needs improvement. I would rather improve the natural service and we can certainly improve the parking lot without spending $4 million. Yeah, I, I, I think we're woefully behind other towns and I, and I, think, um, I think it's something that we definitely need to be considering here. Um, I see, Eric, there's other hands up. I think Susie Tyler had her hand up and Gavin. Well, actually, I'll take them in the following order. I'll take Marianne, iPad three, and then Gavin. Uh, Marianne. No, Joe. Yeah, I might need to unmute her. Where are you? <laughs> uh, thanks. Uh, I just want to uh, support what, what Jeff just said. You know, I, uh, I think the rec department does an amazing job for this town. And I just hate to say anything that's going to make it harder for them to do their job and to support the programs that they support. Uh, so I understand what George is saying and I appreciate it, but I can't get around the fact that uh, these, the surfaces of these fields 
get uh, so hot that it interrupts play if the temperature is, doesn't have to be 90 degrees. There was a study that I just read uh, from uh, a university in Utah that uh, had a turf field and was uh, having problems keeping it usable for the players because even on an October day, if it's sunny, the, uh, the sunlight radiation produces enough heat to make the, uh, the turf field surface 110 degrees. Now at 115 degrees, you can start to get health effects, dehydration and that sort of thing in players. Playing has to be interrupted. On a hot day, they measured up to 200 degrees on a 90 some degree day. And that to me is pretty, pretty alarming. Uh, what they did there was uh, had regular breaks in the play to give the kids some relief. And they, uh, they spray water on the field to cool it down. But we don't have town water. Uh, they, they, they did have town water and they counted the water that are uh, used in the maintenance as a major expense. So that's just another expense, as well as a logistic problem uh, for Sherburn. So, uh, and right now, uh, these turf fields are, are popular. They have been, but they're losing some of their popularity because in spite of what the industry people say, it's theoretically recyclable, but in fact, it's not recyclable because it's not economic to take all those components apart. So it's piling up in the environment and uh, we'll see, but you know, down the road, I would suspect that uh, installation of these things might be uh, dampened by the fact that it's non-recyclable and has all the uh, plastic microparticle problems that come along with it. So that's, that's why I, in spite of my understanding of the need for the kids to play, I'm not sure the kids will be able to play as much as we want them to be able to on this field. Well, thank you. Thank you, Marion. Let me, it looks like we have quite a few hands I go through and I have a feeling that uh, maybe people don't worry to uh, some of these comments, but let me go to, um, you know, I joke iPad three, but it's really Sue Tyler. Hi, Sue. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not gonna voice an opinion for the field or not, but my question is financially, we've heard this one before. Uh, this big project that we've been still working on for five years that was going to cost the town's pack, the taxpayers, one million. We had donations. We had a grant. It was going to be a million. So now we've got another project that is four million. Again, three million in donations, a million bonded. What happens? Is this project going to go forward when they don't have three million? I mean, start it until they have all the money lined up, Susie. That's, well, that's part, okay. of, that's part of their clarify because uh, I that's the first I've heard that. Yeah. And the million is the difference is the millions covered through their revenue and not through taxpayers. Well, I think the revenue from the library paying for yeah. Well, when you've been looking at the library for five years and now it's kind of like the same scenario being presented, mm, it's, it's a lot different. Clarified, thank you. Uh, but let, let me take that and ask a question. So is there a, a town bonding component? There is a town bonding component to this, correct? There's another thing there. So, okay, so there's something there. Okay, let me go on um, to Gavin Miss. Next one online. And Sue, if you could unraise your hand, please. So uh, I am one of the rep commissioners uh, on the board and I wanted to address some of the questions that are being asked, which are great questions, by the way. And these are all questions that we've been asking ourselves for the past year or so. Uh, and there are a few of them, so I apologize to kind of go through all of these. Again, as George said, uh, financially, the warrant is wor worded in such a way so that uh, the million dollar bond is only received upon raising the other $3 million. Uh, on top of that, our goal is to raise the full amount. So while we are uh, hoping to raise the, fu the full $4 million, the bond is to help in case we cannot, but we only get the bond if the 3 million is raised. Uh, in regards to someone mentioning the concern of outside towns renting the field, that is currently happening. Uh, it happens 
you know, quite a bit. It helps to fund the rec department that other towns are using the field. So that is already in place. Nothing would change in that regards. Disagree. Uh, in regards to uh, the heat, uh, that is something that has been discussed. Uh, we are aware of the temperatures rising on very hot days. In regards to the amount that it rises, there are different studies to the amount, but there are components of the turf that can decrease the temperature by 35 degrees compared to previous versions of turf fields. And our hope and plan is to use that type of surface so that it is not nearly as hot as past versions of fields have been. Aside from that fact, the summer usage hours would be much less than the fall and spring. And particularly in the summer, it would be an early morning and late afternoon to avoid those hotter temperatures. Regarding the, the waste portion of this and the recycling, there have been some comments that it cannot be recycled. As a matter of fact, uh, over the past five to 10 years, because recycling has become such a major component just worldwide, most of the, the vendors uh, and contractors who are replacing the fields are being asked to recycle them as part of uh, their fee to replace the turf. And they are being backed into a situation where they have to recycle if they want to get the business. Because there have been concerns of contractors saying they're going to recycle and actually not doing it, there have been tracings put in place to actually trace the whereabouts of the turf that is taken away when it's replaced in 10 to 15 years to ensure that it's actually being recycled. Uh, regarding the toxicity uh, of the infill, we are working with the Board of Health to ensure the safety of everyone in town, especially with the groundwater. Uh, we are looking at uh, organic materials for infill. We are also looking at acrylic coated uh, infill, which is uh, a coating around the crumb rubber. So we are trying to ensure with the Board of Health that all that is being taken care of. So uh, I do not want to minimize any of the questions or the concerns. They are all fair, but they are all concerns that we are not only looking into, but for the most part have resolved. And I know that people will say there are studies and certain things. For every study found in regards to the safety issues they're the same number of studies talking about how safe it is. And I know that the state of Massachusetts itself has done studies that have found that turf fields are safe to be used. Um, but thank you for your time and letting us explain that. And I'd like to, um, and actually um, Sue Tyler, do you mind un unraising her hand? Um, uh, and very appropriately, Daryl Beardsley is the next one up, up the bat. Go ahead, Daryl. All right, so I am going to speak just as an individual because the Board of Health has not finished our discussions yet or come to any uh, decisions as a board. So I, I do want to mention that, and I will uh, send out this article to whomever is interested, but there is an alternative that's been implemented successfully in many places around the country and the world, uh, including Springfield, Massachusetts, that whose fields get heavily used, but also a town more akin to ours is Marblehead, Massachusetts, where they have 20 fields, grass fields that they maintain organically and have since about 1998. Uh, and they have cost information and performance information and they found that it just worked really well and avoided some of the environmental risks that are associated with artificial turf fields. So I think that's something to look towards. I understand you know, comments about the condition of Laurel Field, although I have to say I spent many, many a happy uh, time there with my daughter playing soccer. Um, so I have a, a fondness for those fields and all the fields in, in this general area. Uh, but if we invested in our fields, which we have not done to a great extent and improve them to the degree that this kind of a project would require as well, it would endure. Uh, and there 
again, countless stories of uh, revitalizations of fields that have worked. So it's just an alternative to consider. It eliminates some of the long-term liabilities. It eliminates um, unknown issues that just like PFAS that we're learning about now uh, and issues with microplastics that's new and hasn't been entirely figured out. It's not just an ocean issue, it's in the air we breathe and, and what have you and affecting environments around us. So I will send that information, maybe Eric, I'll send it to you and then you can okay. distribute it to anyone okay. who's interested. Very nice, thank you. Uh, next up is Tom Trainer. I see his hand, but I don't see his screen. But Tom, feel free if I... Thank, thank you, uh, Eric. And uh, thank you, Daryl, for that time uh, at the Board of Health meeting uh, last night. I think a lot of uh, new, new health issues were brought up during that meeting that you won't have time to hear at this meeting. But I, I echo uh, Jeff's and uh, Daryl, Daryl's and uh, Marianne's concerns. And I, I think this is a terrible idea for the uh, town. We're supposed to be a green community, a sustainable community. And, and uh, uh, I apologize uh, in advance, uh, but I uh, re respectively uh, disagree uh, strongly uh, what, what we were just told about the re recycling of these materials. They are not recycled by the industry. They're dumped, they're dumped in uh, wastelands. They're being stored in warehouses. They're being shipped to China. They are not being recycled. But there uh, uh, just uh, one or two other points. Athletes that have a choice uh, are uh, Olympic uh, soccer teams, men and women, refuse to play on uh, artificial turf fields for their health, for their safety. And uh, uh, the new uh, president of the N NFL Players Association, I don't have his name in front of me, but uh, I can get it to you, uh, uh, announced last fall that he's asking the NFL to uh, move away from all artificial turf fields uh, in the league. So. Uh, players uh, that uh, have the option do not want to play on these surfaces. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I, I hope the uh, citizens in town that have any concern about their groundwater, their children's health, uh, the long-term viability of, uh, of uh, this community will uh, reject this warrant. Thank you. Uh, up next is Alicia G. Hi, I'm sorry, it's Alicia Goody yeah. in Zions Lane. Uh, I didn't realize my name was shortened. Um, I'll be quick. Mm -hmm. Just uh, support the comments of Mary and Susie, Daryl, and uh, thank you, Jeff, um, as well. And also Tom Trainer's uh, recent statements about professional and Olympic athletes not liking turf fields. I'm a soccer mom as well. And um, even at the high school level, club level, we had some situations where it got so hot in the summer that uh, not in the high school, but play play was difficult. Um, so I'm opposed to this. And just a, a citation, I think it's the study that Daryl referenced is uh, one that was done by the Toxic Use Reduction Institute, which I believe is uh, at the University of Massachusetts in Lowell. And that does recommend organically managed natural grass as a safer alternative and also a more cost-effective alternative um, rather than when you, especially when you take into the um, decommissioning of these turf fields and the recycling, whether it happens or not. So support all the previous comments and I will pass. Thank you very much, Alicia. And finally, Adam May Weiss. Hi, everyone. So I guess being the mom of a daughter who decided that her passion was goalkeeping about five years ago, I saw all the studies and the concerns about turf fields and especially goalkeepers because they're diving and breathing and inhaling and had a lot of concerns and did a lot of research and found that I don't have the studies right this minute because I wasn't prepared, but found that they did make changes and they are making changes. And yes, there were concerns about 
turf fields and safety, um, but they are making vast improvements and those same safety concerns are not to the same degree as they were. So I feel comfortable. My daughter does soccer six hours a week on a turf field and um, we drive to Taunton so that she can play on a turf field. And then when there's uh, been other times where the town teams have had to look for other fields to play and we're going to Holliston or we're going to Medway. Um, the reality is we're in New England. We have a very short season and we also want our kids to be competitive. Um, yes, we're a small town, but we're competing with this, you know, towns around us and things move a little bit faster these days. And the kids are all, they see what's out there. They see what the other kids are doing. They want to train too, just like these other kids. And so if they're not, if we don't get a field in Sherborne, they're going to go to another field. And natural grass is wonderful when it works well. I know my daughter loves nothing better than, you know, playing in the mud, but you can't, you wreck the fields. And you also, it doesn't help anything with the, um, your season doesn't get extended with natural gas, natural gas, natural grass. So, and also for environmental either, you know, with everyone carpooling and driving longer distances to get to a turf field or all the, the, you know, the grass seeding and the maintenance and the, the mowing ex exhaust and the fertilizers, those also have an environmental impact. So to just say one's worse than the other, there's a lot of other factors at play here. This has been a really long time, long, well thought out plan and proposal. The fields do get rented already by multiple different clubs throughout the season. All of our fields in town do. That's nothing new. We have lots of different clubs that come in and use the fields from lots of different towns. And you know, so the whole Laurel field is not getting all turf. So if it's a really hot extreme day, there'll be a grass field next to it to use. So um, I just think it, like so many things that get a lot of research and have um, they've done the recreate rec commission has done their due, their due diligence they've really looked into this they have a plan they've shown how it's not going to be um, you know the responsibility of the town to that they've got it they've got really rational funding numbers that they are showing okay very good thank you um, I'm gonna bring it back to the board a um, lot of discussion there um, does anyone from the board want to respond? I think we have some different, some pretty polarized thoughts on the board. Does anyone want to respond to any of the comments we just heard? I, I just want to add, I want to support what Addie said about, and I've meant to add after Jeff mentioned about the out-of-town teams, there are a lot of out-of-town men's teams who play. I know they play on Fesenden Field right here on Western Ave every Sunday. Um, there's, I don't think we should be discouraging out-of-town revenue. I, I don't know what the problem with having out of town people coming in and using fields is. If I, I could see it would be a problem if it was taking away from some of our youth sports, but when we have this amount of hours and we can generate more revenue by attracting people to using our resources, I don't see the problem with that. Um, and as Addie said, I mean, think of the amount of gas mileage we're all putting on our cars, driving our kids to other towns to play on turf fields, because that's what the competition is today. And I think, a lot of people don't know what the current, maybe turf fields were a lot different 10, 20 years ago, but they're, they're, there's been a lot of advances in technology. And I think we really need to respect our recreation commission for the amount of re research and due diligence that they've done. They're not gonna put our youth, I mean, all of us have kids. We're not putting our kids at risk for this. It's, it's something that's well thought out and it's something that I think would be very good for the town. So I have, I guess, an administrative question on this per se. Um, the vote tonight is to support. Is that correct? Our vote. Yes, is the issue on the agenda is whether we support this or not. And if I could, I'd suggest deferring this. Uh, as I indicated, I want to see some consultation with the neighbors. Um, they're the ones who have standing to sue if they if we try to do something. Uh, I'd like to see better consensus. We have to get a two thirds vote to get this thing through the town meeting. Uh, it seems like there needs to be more presentations like there was tonight with the PowerPoint presentation, uh, more listening to each other on this. So I, I don't think we're prepared to take a vote 
tonight. Um, I agree with Paul. I do agree. I agree. Yeah, as well. Um, maybe as soon as the, the next, frankly, the next I put on uh, in, in two weeks from now, I personally would like to do some more research. I'd actually like to engage, I'll probably engage someone from the rec department as well. Um, you know, obviously we heard some, uh, some very, I don't know, uh, polarizing information tonight, very polarizing. And I, I actually would like to defer it as well. It is too important to just listen to, you know, these opinions and see this and make a vote on something so large. My personal reservation is a strict that this is a, um, a capital liability. And someone mentioned a library. Well, I don't think you're going to have that same situation at the library. There's a different recipe there. I want to look up certain things like what the bond obligates it, you know, how much flexibility there is there, and um, and just the general concept of a capital liability. Something has to be maintained and whatever, you know, things that make sense now. And I'm also going to talk to a couple other communities that actually have have these fields as well to kind of see, I know, um, you know, their experiences. I'm not going to say I'm forward against it, but I'm, I'm hesitant enough that I support Paul's um, kind of idea to defer this. And I would just like to add a couple things. One is I, I do support the recreation department's effort here. I think they did, I agree with George, put together not only a good presentation, but a rigorous analysis and trying to, to, mm -hmm. to take the responsibility for all the concerns that we all have. Um, I think there are a few things that were mentioned that probably need to be more factually demonstrated. One is I ran the soccer league, the, the Bays League for Dover Sherburn for a number of years too. We do have a lot of people using our fields, but if these are brand new, nice turf fields, it's not going to be the same usage as it has been last year. We're going to get much higher usage from people outside of town if we have two brand new turf fields. I agree. So I don't think it's fair to say it's all we've always had outside towns using the field and they'll just be the same. It's not going to be the same. It's going to be much higher in my view. So we could probably look at towns that um, have gone to a turf field and see what the uptick was. Second, and I think they pointed out astutely that they do have some film materials that are way less toxic, included the, the coded particles and uh, other options. Those are not what's factored into the cost here. What's factored in the cost, if I was to understand it correctly last night, is the pulverized used tire. So if we wanna go to those options, they're much safer and they're much, much more expensive. So I, I'm not expecting we address that tonight, but we may have to make qualitative statements that match the costs that are included in the project and not promote things that are less toxic, but are not in the scope. So, and I certainly agree that we would like to uh, uh, defer this. Okay, very good. So I don't think we need a vote to defer. I think it would just simply let's go on to the next agenda item. Mean, unless there's any, uh, um, Gavin, you have something to say? Is it you know we're going to defer this? Is it, I saw your your hand is up. Is it something quick? Just a, a quick mention in, in regards to the presentation last night. The the crumb rubber was the first choice because we have found from research that it was safe. But we did have the second choice was the coated crumb rubber. And uh, as a committee, we are fine going with that. And the cost difference is minimal overall between that first choice and second choice. So if the, if the board and if the board of health felt that that second choice was a better one to go with, the cost difference isn't too much that we couldn't make it happen if it was safer from uh, everyone's perspective. Good. Thanks, right. Kevin. Very good. All right. With no further ado, I'm going to go on to the second capital item, command vehicle and hose replacement. Uh, Zach Ward, fire chief, I believe is on this call now. Welcome back. Hey, I'm running a little late and uh, tonight yeah. just didn't go as planned. I was actually going to share my screen with a small uh, PowerPoint, uh, but I'm not able to. So I'm just going to talk through it uh, quickly. Um, so as you can see, the fire department has two capital items this year. Uh, there's a couple different totals there and I'll get into that, but the, the basic total uh, for both is 82,000. Um, our original capital plan this year called for 297,000, uh, but we were able to lower that number um, through pursuing grants and some other projects. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So the first uh, item is the command vehicle. Um, and, and basically what we're looking to do is, is replace the current one after several years of use. Uh, we've found some issues with the current vehicle. Um, some of the major points to that are uh, the vehicle size, both just as a regular vehicle driving around and then as a command post. Uh, also it's fuel cons consumption, which is about nine uh, miles per gallon currently. Um, it's really not set up to command an incident 
um, in bad weather. And it's not really designed for one person to operate, which is what we typically have at a command post in Sherburn. Um, <clears throat> um, and what we're looking to do is just replace that with a smaller uh, SUV type vehicle, uh, which would be a, obviously a lot shorter uh, just for typical driving around. Uh, and it's about 10 feet shorter uh, for a command post um, because the plan would be to just open up the hatchback and everything's right there. The current vehicle has a slide out, which slides out uh, 10 feet out of the rear, excuse me, eight feet out of the rear uh, bed. Um, so it's, it's kind of difficult to park it at certain incident scenes, you know, especially if we're up a long driveway or in a tight area, um, similar to a lot of our areas in town. Um, and the, the proposed vehicle would be about uh, 18 to 20 miles per gallon. So we're looking to double the fuel mileage that we're getting. Um, and it would be covered under weather because the hatchback would um, cover it. Um, <clears throat> so what we're looking to do is purchase a new vehicle uh, for 45000 um, and we're looking to sell the old one um, and regain most of that money back. And, and we think we can get about 30,000 uh, for the old vehicle. Um, and then if you take that, that 15,000 that's left over um, and you, multi uh, you divide that by the 10 years that we expect the new vehicle to last, the cost is obviously uh, around $1,500 a year, but we expect the fuel savings to be about $2,000 a year. So this sort of a net savings for the town in the long run. Um, that covers the command vehicle. I'll just run through the hose quickly. Um, so we're looking to replace some of our hose um, that's about 30 years old. As you know, we're in OSHA state. We, we bring in an outside te hose testing company now every year that tests all of our structural fire hose. Mm -hmm. um, and two years ago, we lost like 4,000 feet of hose, which was uh, the most that that company's ever seen lost in a single day. So we, we took that award away from them. They're actually out in New Jersey that they, they do this all over the East coast. Um, and then last year we lost another couple thousand feet. So we're looking to replace some hose. Um, again, some of this stuff is 30 years old. Some of it was donated from Massport, which is the Logan airport fire department like 25 years ago. Um, so the, this hose really doesn't know the town much. Um, but there is certainly a lot of liability with fire hose, um, that uh, you, could, you could see that after the, uh, the Back Bay fire in Boston six, seven years ago when the two firefighters got killed, there was a lot of talk about whether the hose line burst, um, which is why we test them and, and which is why we're looking to replace some of that stuff um, so we don't have that happen. So, and those are the two items, sir. Thank you, Zach. Quick question, Zach. Um, how many miles a year approximately does the command vehicle get? Probably 10,000. Okay. Okay, just curious on that. Um, yeah, and that's quite a trade-in, by the way, the existing vehicle. And I'm assuming at nine miles a gallon, it probably was not approved by the Sustainability Committee. All I right. I don't believe so. <laughs> I see, I suppose the bow watch on the front of it is the other problem. Any uh, questions from the board? <coughs> uh, seeing none, any questions from the general public? Okay, any uh, motions on the board? Yeah. Yeah, Paul. I, I think we should follow the leadership of our fire chief. That's what he's here for and knows what is needed. So I move to support the purchases he's outlined. All right, very good. Uh, is there a second? Second. All right, second by Jeff. I'll say I just banged my calculator real quick. I'm going to be saving about $2,000 a year in gas. All right, all in favor, George. Aye. Jeff. All right. Paul? Aye. I am I as well. All right. Very good, Zach. Thank you. Thank you all very Thanks, much. Sir. Thanks. Number three, police department cruisers, uh, two of them from uh, Chief David Bento. I didn't see him. I'm sure he's still chief? somewhere. Yes, chief on. I didn't even look at the list. Uh, where are you, David? Come on here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Now we can. Yes. yes. Okay. And I was trying to turn the video on, but I'm having trouble doing that. Give me one second. There we go. Yeah. Good evening. Mm -hmm. So um, I also don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but uh, certainly we'll be able to have a brief one for um, when town meeting rolls around, if we get that far uh, for this. But um, th these are the uh, the cruiser requests that I.
presented to the Capital Budget Committee as well as the Advisory Board. And what I was uh, hoping to do for fiscal 22 was to actually get rid of three cruisers. One is a 2016 Ford Explorer, fully marked, currently at 90,000 miles. The next one is a 2013 Chevy Impala with 80,000 miles, that's an unmarked. And then the third is a 2010 Ford Taurus, currently at 100,000 miles, also an unmarked. And what I was hoping to do is get rid of three and replace with just two so that we'd reduce the size of the fleet from a total of 10 cars down to nine. Um, this is something that advisory has asked me in the past about. Um, and with some of the maintenance issues we've been having, especially with you know, 10 year old cars, uh, it doesn't really make sense to keep putting money into them. So uh, what I was hoping to do was replace the two unmarks with one new unmarked um, and then replace the marked with one new marked and that would be uh, two Chevy Tahoes that uh, the quotes that I got for the vehicles uh, and the upfits and then factoring in the trade allowances uh, came in at $99,000. The um, only stipulation on one of the trade-ins would be the Chevy Impala. That car was purchased with uh, asset forfeiture money, which is uh, money that's you know seized from drug cases. So because it was purchased, it was, it was purchased used from Odessa using drug funds. So when we get rid of it, the money has to go back into that account. It can't go back into a general fund or it can't go back into a cruiser account. It has to go back into the law enforcement trust. Uh, honestly, at 2013, with that kind of mileage, we're probably only talking a couple thousand dollars anyway. So um, what we are able to do is use that money to uh, purchase other equipment that the town is currently not funding. So it is a benefit as well. And uh, that is pretty much all I have. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them for you. Any, uh, Jeff. Yeah, David, it sounds like this is pretty wrapped up. Um, and I think it's a good recommendation. I'm wondering if, if not this year, if other years we can look at electric vehicles and maybe work with the sustainability on maybe getting some grants or just to show that we're a green community, if we can. Because yeah. I know there are communities that do have a, a electric police vehicles. Yeah. I don't know if they're on the mass bidding list or not yet, but. Well, funny you mention that. And I, I haven't completed the, the capital budget asked me to actually come back with a five-year plan. And um, I've spoken with uh, the assistant town administrator and uh, Diane Moores and, and also with Gino um, and had a discussion about possibly putting in some sort of a solar um, the panel on top of a small carport that would get us two things. One would be some protection on our cruisers and also the ability to generate electricity, which we could then use to charge some electric vehicles. And surprisingly enough, um, I'm, I'm actually not kidding, uh, Teslas have been used as police cruisers, not the really high end ones that are $100,000, so don't get worried. But <laughs> the, the more modest, you know, $30,000, $40,000 and it's an all wheel drive car. Mm -hmm. And um, there are some departments around the country that have been using them and I've actually been looking into it. And, you know, I think in a, in a small town like Sherburn where we wouldn't have to be worrying about being too far away and having the, the battery need a recharge. You know, if you're, if you're on the north side of town and the battery gets low, you drive it back to the station, plug it in and take another car. So right. yeah, Gino was gonna, was gonna look into how some of those grant uh, processes might work. And I was going to look further into the car process. And um, it's definitely something I think down the road uh, we should be able to do here. Yeah, thank you. A police test will be interesting, especially since there's a button called loot, loot, what's it, ludicrous speed, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> they have killer acceleration. Those, those, yeah, a, lot of, those, a lot of torque. A lot of torque. The torque is super high. The yeah. power band on electric motor is actually much more um, efficient than a power on an internal combustion engine. It, it right, is. Any other questions from the, uh, from the board? How about the public in general? Any question on the public? Use a virtual hand. Okay, seeing none. Uh, motion relative to this. Uh, yes, oh, Paul. Happy to make a motion on the same basis as I made the last one. We have our police chief. He's the one that knows best the needs of the department. This is his recommendation. I believe we should support it. And therefore, I would move to support his capital plans. All right, so moved. And a second? Second. Second by Jeff. All in favor, George? Aye. 
Jeff? Aye. Paul? Aye. I am I as well. All right. Congratulations, Chief. There you go. Thanks, David. Okay, I'm going to label the rest of this agenda item the Sean Show. <laughs> I'll if say it three times fast. <laughs> That's usually not a good thing to name it. <laughs> All right. Uh, All right. Let's, Mr. Uh, let's Chair, start. I'm going to ask that we somewhat inverse the order because there's a sure. number eight and nine, there's a handful of people here. So I don't want to bore them with the equipment we're going to purchase. Um, can we just jump to the Pine Hill Access Road because it's more of a discussion than anything else? Uh, Absolutely. If, if there's a, if there's a, a people here attending, I fully support that. I don't think we have to vote for that. I think, well, yeah, that's a no brainer. Exactly. So um, just to update everyone on the Pine Hill uh, access road and campus improvements, this was put into motion a little over a year ago. As everyone remembers, um, we hired Green International to study the plans that, that had been done, study what was going on. Um, of course, we started that pre-COVID and then continued on um, with studying what was going on, which, which by the way, is, is drastically different uh, than the world we knew before. Even, even with the school population down for most of this year, the, the traffic, and uh, some others might want to speak to that when I'm done, the, the traffic has changed quite a bit. Uh, but the design hasn't much. We, we changed the design a little bit from what we had in 2012. Um, a, a few things. The, uh, we all know the, the bus loop goes away. The traffic will flow one way into Pine Hill Lane, and it'll all exit at Elliott. Um, the entire parking lot is going to come up. It, it needs that regardless of whether we do the road today or a year from now. It's not going to last much longer anyway. It's peeling up. Um, obviously, new lighting with the new configuration of the, the parking lot. And then again, uh, some subtle lighting going down the road. I have where we're at right now, which was the commitment we had was we would get the project ready to go out to bid. And it's officially there as of this week, we have the, the entire package um, minus the actual bid documents that, that could go out. Uh, I, I've gone through the plans. There, there's really nothing I can screen share here that would that would look like anything on anyone's screen. Uh, if this was in person, I would have brought some of the plans, but they, they really need to be large scale to see them. Uh, so that's where we're at. The intent originally was um, to try to pull this off over the summer. The, um, the, the traffic right now is almost impossible to manage. There's, there's police at one, if not both ends, uh, in the morning and at night. They've had to start using the access road uh, because the buses couldn't come back out with the with the school drop off. So they're using a gravel road right now that's that's in pretty tough shape. Uh, that's about where I'll leave it. We we all know that there's a there's an earmark. There was a bond bill that was signed. Um, earlier this year by the governor with a $1.3 million earmark. That's basically just a rewrite of the original earmark from 2011, I believe, um, or maybe 2012. It, it's really only in the second phase. It's on the bond bill that was passed, but it hasn't been, uh, it's not funded. And, and there's really no, no telling when that might get funded. Uh, one other thing I have, an engineer's estimate, um, which has a total of one, it, it's estimated at 1.6 million. Um, and that's the entire project. That's not just the access road. That includes from work at the very front door through the parking lot and out and, and the lighting and everything. Okay. Um, before I take questions uh, from the board, uh, my, my main reservation, we've, which Sean and I have talked about for a few years now, is the fact that this was constructed right across from a driveway. If there's going to be a signalization on it, you know, I'm always concerned about signalizing someone's driveway and easements and loops need to put in there, cameras and blah, blah, blah. And so I, I still have, um, you know, I still support overall a paved access road. I'm just still have some uh, questions on um, if it should be signalized or how one would signalize it. Um, is there any discussion amongst the board on this? Well, just that I asked that same question, and that's not included in that project cost right now. 
or the design. Uh, George, you had a. I just, I mean, my kids are not at Pine Hill anymore, so I haven't dealt with the nightmare that other parents have told me about this year. But I, I really worry that if we don't do something immediately, there's going to be a tragedy. It's really that bad. It was that bad before the pandemic, and now there's even more people dropping off kids. It's it's a nightmare. It's something that we should have been should have been done a long time ago. It needs to be a one way through there. It's a safety issue for all their children. Um, it, it, to me, it's a no brainer. We have to spend the money on it. Hopefully, we can get the state to help support it. Uh, it's and I I see. Andrew Keo on here. Hopefully, he can add some words to it as well if if he's willing to speak when after we talk on the board. Okay. Uh, Paul, do you you had, you had your hand up for a second or? But just yeah, I was just going to say that it's going to make a huge difference if we get the state money and if, or if we don't, we would if we don't have it, we would have to go borrow one point six million for this road and uh, getting the state money really has to wait until the project is bid and you are able to have an actual number here, not just a engineer's projection. You really need some hard numbers. So we're not gonna know that until this thing goes out to bid. It may make sense to go out to bid before town meeting so that an effort can be made to see if we can <laughs> get the, the uh, the second part of this is the, the, the governor has to actually decide to bond, to issue a bond. In other words, the earmark is in a, a statute that authorizes the Commonwealth to borrow the money. The, whether the Commonwealth borrows the money is up to the governor. And past experiences, you really need to have a more definitive stage of the project where you've got cost numbers, you know exactly what you're doing and you're able to uh, uh, show the need. I, I definitely need to get that money. I definitely support um, going to bid before it. Um, right now, road projects are skyrocketing in prices. Um, I was just on the MPO meeting this morning where they do all the TIP funds, the large state projects around the state. And it's right now underfunded because gravel borrow and uh, asphalt are going through the roof right now. The, this, this cost estimate might already be antiquated. I don't know. So I would actually support, I support the project, but I also support going to bid before, uh, before town meeting, having a real number. And you can do that pretty easily. You can actually say contingent upon town meeting, you know, you go to bid and say contingent upon town meeting approval. We've done that before. Yes, that's what I, I agree. I, that's what I'm suggesting. Yep. Um, any questions from or any comments from the general public? Does anyone want to speak on this? Andrew Keogh has got his hand up. And does he? Okay. Is it a physical hand or a metaphor? Yeah, physical Sorry, hand. Eric. I see his physical okay. hand. <laughs> uh, you can't get you can't get too complicated with me, Eric. I just <laughs> I'm not that good. I'm old. The thing is, you're on my other screen, so I have to shift. I have to go back and forth between two different screens there. Sorry. Oh, yeah, uh, go ahead, Dr. Keel. Um, so and thank you guys for uh, for even entertaining this. And Sean, thank you so much for all the time and energy that you've put into this. Um, you know, it's hard to, I get it. I totally get how hard it is to you know, make ends meet in our community. We've, we have on the school's end really worked very hard. I hope you guys notice we've been killing ourselves to be responsible with our spending. And uh, so when we do come forward, it's because we really need something. And that has always been my approach to building budgets. And I was lucky enough to, uh, to work with Don Fattori these past four years because Philosophically, we're in direct alignment on that. We don't like asking for things unless we need it, and we don't uh, we don't say to people uh, to our uh, directors, "Hey, you know, you had three thousand last year for this, so you know, why don't you ask for thirty two hundred? Like, no. If you bought something last year and you used it and you don't need it anymore, then we go back to zero, and that's how we've been budgeting. and And I think that we've shown. Uh, Responsi responsibility. But, you know, when I interviewed for this job, they asked me what my number one priority would be as the superintendent. 
And some of you may have even been there for those conversations. And my answer was to protect the kids. That's the number one responsibility of any school leader is student safety. And anyone who doesn't get that as a school leader is just an absolute fool. It's, it's the bottom line. It's what our families expect of us is to protect their children. And uh, I really, I get, I get Sherburn, uh, I'm on Sherburn time. And Sherburn time to me means I show up five minutes late for everything. In Sherburn, we move at our own pace and I totally get that and that's fine. I'm, I'm okay with it. I've lived here since 1969. When the library, the new, the, I still consider it the new library. <laughs> uh, that was going into place and I was at Center School. So I totally get uh, how we don't necessarily like to jump at things. But when you're talking about a safety thing, I, 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 I say this now as a, uh, as a resident, I think you have to you, you have to you have to pony up. I really do. And I think if you ask the public, they're going to say the same thing. They're just going to say we've got to do it. And uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, I I don't know about the construction costs, Eric. Uh, I don't know anything about that. But I think I might be wrong. But I think that borrowing right now is not a bad uh, it's not a bad time to be borrowing. And along those lines at the region, just so you guys know, we're, we're to that end about being responsible with our money. You know, we created an OPEB trust so that we don't have all this added liability on the books and so that we can borrow uh, more reasonably at the region when the time comes, because it will come. So we've tried to act responsibly. I really think the time is now. I, I'm, uh, I recognize that, uh, and I agree with Paul totally, if we, could, if we can find another way to fund it, by all means, let's do that, uh, obviously. But if we can't, uh, I think we should try to move forward with the townspeople, uh, A. And B, with regards to the light, when we were having these conversations uh, along the way, and I have, have not spoken with Dave Bento, so, but with Chief Thompson, the feeling was that if we had the flashing school zone lights and an officer at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day for a, a window of time, because it is a fairly quick drop off pickup, it would be at least if the line could move, uh, we feel like we could cover that. So uh, without having to put in a light, because you know <laughs> that to me is a, it's a non-starter in Sherburn. We don't like uh, lights, obviously. And uh, so that's all I would say to that. And uh, I appreciate the time and I appreciate uh, the thoughtful conversation. I, I had one question. I know it pops up every now and then of what, what's the lifespan of Pine Hill itself? Because, you know, if we're going to put in a million plus dollar investment and so on like that, uh, I obviously, you know, it's so hard to predict 10, 20, 30 years. I mean, I still call it the new elementary school, by the way. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, that that sign, I mean, that library wing went on uh, when I went in there the year before I went in. I think my uncle Joe, who was on here, Joe Meany, was involved in, uh, in that um, at the time, perhaps from a school committee angle. Uh, it's a great question, Eric. The bottom line is that, you know, it's still meeting our purposes. And I think. Uh, it's a, a credit to all of you. We said this the other night in Dover, and I'm glad I have this opportunity to say it here in Sherburn. It is a credit to the people of these towns that you've taken care of these buildings, A, and that you've kept your class sizes reasonable. And that is what, is what allowed us to bring our little kids in four days a week back in October. Some places are still asking me today, how did you do it? That was in October. And then we brought the fifth, fourth and fifth in four days in December. And that's because the school, the class sizes have been maintained at a reasonable number and always uh, difficult, always a battle, uh, but we've maintained reasonable class sizes and we've maintained that building and we were able to, granted, it's not a new ventilation system. So we did have to uh, uh, purchase uh, uh, freestanding air filtration units, but at a reasonable cost. And, uh, and it allowed us to, to continue on. So the school itself is, I think part of the problem is we love it, right? People of Sherman love that school because it's small and it's quaint. It feels like home. And you can go to other schools, even Chickering feels very, very different with its high ceilings. It's just, it just feels very different. And 
There's something about Pine Hill that feels comfortable and comforting. And so I don't think anyone's in a rush to, to tear it down, but functionally, functionally, we are starting to have some trouble. It's hard for us. We don't have the special needs uh, programming or spaces for special needs students that we need. The school was built in the 50s. That was a whole different era, obviously. And so we don't have the breakout spaces that we need. We don't have the office spaces that we need. Uh, but, uh, but functionally, it's a beautiful place. The windows are beautiful. The lighting in that place is beautiful. And so uh, to answer your question, Eric, I, I personally don't think that that school needs to be replaced in the next 10 years anyhow, uh, and, and maybe more. Uh, and to that end, uh, typically um, what places will do, and I've been through three building projects, including Wellesley's, and most of you probably know that, that uh, site and how, how limited it was. We literally built that new school right around the old building. They had to buy three houses in order to do it. And they wrapped it right around it. And that's a typical experience. They build the school in the field space next to it, and then they tear down the other one or they take out a piece at a time. And uh, so I don't think you would um, have to lose this road uh, just because you built a new school. So that's how I'd respond to that. Sorry for the long-winded answer. No, very good. Thank you very much. Um, okay, any discussion amongst the board here? I think no, I think it's a great project. And I was gonna do two shout outs. Don Fator, I agree, she's a rock star. And Jill Fador, in addition mm -hmm. to doing all the mirror, Andy and his team have done a great job, but Jill Fedor, I'm telling you, she she's really remarkable. So she's not on tonight, unfortunately, but tell her thanks for us, Andy. I will do that, Jeff. And uh, perhaps you can give the first donation when we build the statue to our nurses. Okay. <laughs> All right, very good. Um, actually, we're talking about you know old school stuff. I'm gonna shamelessly plug that. I'm trying to get rid of a cabinet right now that actually used to belong to Solon Academy. So if anyone wants a Solon Academy uh, cabinet, let me know. Shoot me a message. That's awesome. Can I make a motion to support the Pine Hill Access Road? Absolutely. I, I wonder, do we need to wait until we have the bids? I mean, we don't even know the cost right now. I don't know. I, 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 I agree support with you it. I think, I think as Dr. Keo suggested, hopefully we get the state money, but I think our kids' safety is more important than anything. And I think we go to the town and say, ask for the whole cost of it. And hopefully we don't need to borrow that much when we get state funding. I think it's that important that we okay. forward All with right. it anyway. Well, I think the reason for the bid, George, just knows is that 1.3 might not be enough. Right. Like I think having right. a number, actually you might, I, I still support going to bid. Like I think we can still vote for this, mm -hmm. but whoever it be like Sean or David or whatever. Oh, I, else, I agree. I think we yeah. definitely should go to bid. Absolutely. Yeah, my, my point here is that if we vote to support this article at, at 1.3 or 1.6, we may very well, that vote may count for nothing because the reality might be that maybe it's two million and maybe it's two and a half million. We're going to have to revisit this at some point yeah. to when we have the real numbers. Hopefully okay. the numbers go down and not up, but yeah. my experience is that you should go up. I agree with what you said, George. I just think having to act, because am I right? This would require a two thirds vote yes. if it's yes. bonded, right? Because so I, think, I think what we should do is whatever the cost does come in, and I agree we should go to bid, we should vote, we should have a Warren article that supports the full cost. And we should explain that we're hoping to get some state funds to help support that. But I think it's that important that we get approval to do it, whatever the cost may be. All right, so there's a motion. There's a motion, act of motion right now to support this uh, capital item. Do I have a second? Second. All right. Um, all in favor, George? Aye. Jeff? Aye. Uh, Paul? Aye. Aye, I might as well. Okay, very good. One last interesting data point when we get the bids is like a ballpark project duration too. I don't know how long it, this project is, but that'd be interesting to know with the relative to COVID, to weather and the school start year issues. Yeah. This is obviously a summer project, right, Sean? <laughs> I mean, what, I mean, would it be probably wouldn't be would it be able to get done this summer if we had a bid ready to go? I, I got to work through that with the engineers. The, the issue is, and and we're not going to solve it tonight. Um, it'd be nice to put the bid out and say you have to have it done by the end of summer, but we, I can't commit till July first. So that's it's physically <laughs> it's impossible. So there's ways we're gonna we're gonna try to stage it and say certain sections have to be done. 
Um, you know, in an ideal world, I, I would have worked on it in COVID, but we didn't get to work on much during COVID. So, I uh, thought there was a way to expend a bonded item between town meeting approval and the beginning of the fiscal year. I thought there, there was is. a way to do that. There yeah. is. It's too complicated to explain it here. Yeah. Well, but it, it, well, it's it, only it, two it, weeks this year, though. Yeah, we're not having town meeting until. <laughs> and not only that, it has to be actual. It has to be the election, right? If we yeah, have it would to be on the vote. ballot. So yeah, we, that's that's right. It's not. Yeah, it's got to make the ballot, and then it's only two weeks to July. Uh, yeah, yeah. July first. And I think it yeah. might be hard, George, because the reason these paving costs are going up is because everyone's doing it in COVID. So it may actually. No, I know. Be right. Well, and the 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 other issue is if you if you shorten the timeline too much, there's too much uncertainty right now with COVID. Any they're they're either going to intentionally not make it, um, just ignore it because you, you the out is COVID on uh, on deadlines or it'll raise the cost too much and we don't want to just uh, unnecessarily raise the cost we'll figure i'll figure out the logistics the best way we think we can put it out to bid and we'll get it out to bid and hopefully walk in with a good number all right i like that idea uh, david thanks, has a stand up. thanks andy oh, uh david david, david williams had a stand Did someone oh, david, say yeah. that, you, that this would need two-thirds vote if it's bonded i'm quite sure yeah. yes yep Two thirds to borrow money. And it would be a debt exclusion. Yeah, that's what I thought too. And it's it's the write up we have from uh, council's review does not say that. So I'll I'll yeah. correct it tomorrow. Okay. Well, thank you guys very much. Um, really appreciate Thanks, it, Doctor Kiel. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Sean, again. Thank you. Let me know. Good night, everyone. Okay, I'll drop the cabinet off tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> okay, Eric. <laughs> Number nine. Why don't you leave it at the uh, CM CMD? <laughs> well, there's no more swamp shop anymore. And what do I do? It's an old wood cabinet from like the turn of the century. Uh, well, no, seriously. I don't know. With any luck, there's going to be a swamp shop. Sh uh, shoot me a picture, Eric. Right, I'm going. interested. Hey, hey Eric, there's a, there's a secret compartment in that cabinet. <laughs> 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 I think it was a, it was a chemistry cabinet actually of Solomon Academy. My dad got it. Okay, That's number awesome. nine. Good Haven, Leo. Oh, yeah, I'm batting a thousand, so let's get on this one, Arnold. Yeah. Pine Hill, I mean, uh, Wood Haven, Leland. In your packets, um, there was a lot of documents. There was also um, the engineering report. We we've already been through this, so for the benefit of everyone else, um, where we're at now is after a couple of positive votes from the board, we have engineered and are working uh, closely with uh, Whitewater Inc who operates both of the public water supplies, one at Leland, one at Woodhaven, is working with DEP um, for the preliminary work to, to permit a single public water supply that'll combine both, both of those um, complexes and utilize potentially all four wells that are there. Um, the, the main issue for anyone that hasn't been paying attention is to varying degrees, all of the wells up there have, have corrosive water. Mm -hmm. Um, it's all drinkable and it's all safe to drink, but it's hard on the pipes. It's hard on the plumbing. It's hard on the water heaters. Um, and what it does is it raises the levels of copper and potentially lead in the water. So, um, Leland had a demand letter, several of them actually, that they had to make improvements. So fast forward to today, we have the engineering, we're on our way to having approval from DEP. We have uh, an engineer's estimate based on what they, their assumptions um, of what DEP was gonna uh, basically endorse uh, for the work and how they were gonna do it. Um, and that, you know, that, that estimate's 180. So the article is going to be 198. So it includes another contingency on top of that to do the work. Um, and that's the article is for the borrowing to have that done. And then we're working, the tent, we're, we're working um, with council to make sure we have a structure in place, which isn't defined tonight um, for how a, that, the repayment of that fund is going to be uh, divvied up. And then obviously the ongoing operating costs. Now I, I will mention that the ongoing operating costs as a combined system is going to be better and cheaper um, 
than having two systems on basically the same piece of property. Um, they're going to, they're going to, it's going to share a lot of costs that would otherwise have been just doubled up on the two systems. So the, there's at this stage, there's still, still some unknowns on that end, but, but there's an absolute certainty that the town committed to doing this and DEP is going to hold us to that. So we're going to town meeting with, with the clean article to, to fund it and, and get the work done. Okay. Uh, any uh, questions, comments from the board? Okay, how about the general public? So I just have one question. When you say it's corrosive water, it's hard water? So you see manganese or whatever, it's uh, or is it pH? Hard, in the, hard with a pH that's on the corrosive side. Okay. No. And then without the, without the study open, we're gonna go over my head chemically, but uh, that's not true for at least one person that's on this call. All right, I, I support this. You know, it's what we do. I, we don't have a general, uh, we don't have a, 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 a widespread municipal water supply, but we are water suppliers. Um, I think the water quite, uh, we all these residents uh, quality water. I know um, my mother lived there. She actually had her water heater um, burst. And um, I suspect it was probably due uh, to this issue, to be honest with you. So is there any motion relative to this? I move to support the article. All right. Second that. Second by Jeff. All right. All in favor, George? Aye. Jeff? Aye. Paul? Aye. I am I as well. All right. How do you want to do the rest of them, Sean? Just uh, four through seven? One through yeah, three. I'm going home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you are home. Good. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You are. <laughs> Who are you kidding? <laughs> no, I'm a couple hundred feet from home. I'm at my desk. That's right. Um, well, the agenda, you guys are looking at the warrant, but I don't I don't have that in front of me. But we currently, we change, I hope it shows up on the warrant. We don't have the non-road work, road work. All we have is, um, sorry, I'm staring at a different screen. Um, it's roadway management, I think you call it now. Yeah, well, I, I mean, we can jump to the, the, the equipment itself. I didn't split out, split out the equipment because I, I, <laughs> I knocked out a bunch of items I was going to try and do this year. Um, it's actually remarkably hard difficult to buy anything right now uh, everything's basically back ordered in the world but one two things we need equipment wise is uh what they it's it's made by toro it's called a dingo it's a it's a small machine you ride on it it's it's like a mini loader but it has a lot of implements we rented one um a couple different times but total a couple months last year and it, and it did everything from rebuilding the, the ball fields um because there's a lot of work that goes into putting the fields together each spring and th there's a lot of labor that goes into it we did roadside mowing and uh some other work with that um uh, with the dingo so we're going to purchase one they're pretty expensive to rent you can't rent them when you need them because everyone wants them at the same time it's something we'll use 12 months a year it's, a, it's also going to supplement um the snow blowing we're going to increase how many sidewalks were snow blowing um you know with the second north main street sidewalk there's a lot of walkways at the library which will be online next year uh, so this piece of equipment will be used all winter for that as well and then another roadside mower that's going to be used for uh that'll go on the back of the john deere tractor we bought a couple years ago uh, we haven't upgraded any of the mowers to go along with that tractor when we bought it most of the stuff was designed for a, a smaller mower and roadside mowers in Sherman don't last long. They bounce off all the stone walls, telephone poles, trees, stumps. Uh, so they take a pretty hard beating and we use them. It's a couple months a year just to keep the roadsides cut back so everyone can see. Those are the only two pieces in that, um, in that article. The one ton truck is separate. Uh, that's, Another one right now, the fleet is a little bit heavy because we're in COVID. We've had to retain some of the vehicles we were going to get rid of because we're basically still holding the one truck per guy. Uh, that was one of the main things that was getting a lot of people uh, quarantined throughout the state was sending crews out in the same truck. So for the foreseeable future, that'll, that'll continue. And then 
Um, in all likelihood, a truck right now being ordered from Ford, we're not going to see for a year anyway. Um, so as much as it sounds like, well, you hold off till everything calms down. If we don't get in line, some of these trucks we're going to, we're going to hang on to for an extra two years beyond where we should be. And, um, uh, and once we cycle back in, we'll be buying much bigger trucks than these because I've held off four years now on any of the larger trucks. So those are coming. I'd rather just get through this. And that's another hook lift. If anyone remembers the last Ford we bought was a hook lift. So it, it runs multiple bodies. It runs the chipper, it runs a sander, it runs a dump truck. Um, we've started spraying in the winter. So one of the bodies will keep the sprayer on it. Um, you can imagine you don't want to run around with a tank full of brine in the middle of a snowstorm uh, plowing. So you use it and then you want to be able to shed it off, leave it in the shop till the storm's over. So that, that truck will work great, but we're over to utilizing the one we have. So we're going to get a second one and they'll share bodies. They'll use all the same bodies. Should I stop and let you vote on each one or keep going? Uh, how does the board feel? I guess. Uh... Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Probably at the advisory hearing. I didn't, I didn't want to go through um, any of the presentations. We did a second round of roadway assessment. I don't know what number you guys are on. I'm looking at a different sheet. I'm doing roadway management now. Yeah. Um, but they came, they came in, they scanned all the roads last fall. Um, and they do an extensive assessment of the the condition of all the asphalt um so we did that and i'm going to share it and probably present that at the advisory hearing um it's it's a interesting map you, it's all color coded you can see which roads are kind of falling off the cliff which ones are holding on um, it helps us assess what type of fixes we can do with with the limited funds we have we can't just rip up and rebuild every road in town um, and, and there's some wise decisions that can be made to spend money before a road falls apart to the point where it has to be. So this year, again, right now it's set at 450. Um, I expect a little bit more conversation next Wednesday with, with advisory on where that level will be. Um, that includes the assessment, which is strictly pavement. That's, that's all it assesses. And then whatever factor you add to that for the infrastructure improvements that, that need to go along with, with certain parts of it. When you pave, you obviously spend a lot of money on drainage, just fixing the catch basins and maybe culverts. We spent a lot of money on a culvert replacement last year that came out of the, the uh, town meeting article. And again, this is all in excess of what chapter 90 funds. If we were to try to hold just to chapter 90, we'd all be driving on uh, roads that look like green lane or worse so we have to we have to fund the roads with something more than what the state gives us i'm gonna keep going okay buildings are the same thing uh, we had on-site insight come in uh, and assess this year all of let me try i don't think buildings is on our agenda does anyone else see buildings? Oh, maybe it's not I don't know if you can talk about it, but it's not on the agenda. Cool. I won't talk about it. <laughs> Unless what, someone something well, let me, all right. I'll tell you briefly. No, I won't even bother. Forget it. Well, what does it SSB up. mean? What's that? SSB. Sure, Hold on, I'm trying. It's under town buildings and facilities. You have SSB. Sherburn Select Board. Oh, that's what that that's means. you oh you look are you looking at the warrant yeah the agenda yeah i'm looking at the agenda paul's well, looking, looking at the at warrant the right warrant. right so real briefly since you have me what we what we are removing from the warrant um is going to be what we call the uh replacement reserve fund both the creation of it and the funding of it and so that obviously changes. We still we need the funding for the town building. So we were, it's it should be named exactly what it was last year, um, and and I think has been for three or four consecutive years. 
in the in the capital items. So okay. we can talk about that next time. Okay. Yeah, that's appropriate. So I think we've hit everything. We've hit uh, equipment on road, equipment road, one ton truck, and roadway management. This is the so, four items on the agenda. If I could make a motion, the same as the other ones, which is that our DPW director knows best what he needs to keep our roads going and our equipment going. And therefore, I move that we support the, the items he's identified. All right, so moved. Is there a second? Okay, second by George. Just you know, Jeff, you're muted, just you know. Okay, um, all in favor, George? Aye. Uh, Jeff? Aye. Uh, Paul? Aye. I am I as well. Okay, very good. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. On to agenda item 5C. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, FY22 ominous budget under the select board. Discussion or consideration of select board budgets. Um, FY22 prior to advisory hearings. And we had some background material from, uh, from the CFO. Um, I guess, David, who's taking the lead on this? Um. Is it Sharon or is it you, David? It would be the CFO, but um, she's here. Sharon, are you here? She is here. I think. Sharon, you. She's not responding. I tried to unmute her, but I think she's got to unmute herself. Deb, are you in it, aware of anything um, for the omnibus budget? I, I am not aware of anything. I can give Sharon a call if you want. Can, can I just make a comment? I just yeah. been scrolling through these budgets and this is why I like to see them all at once. And right now we're looking at jumping over a $20 uh, tax rate. I think a lot of our budgets are significantly increasing. I still can't see the DPW budget as a whole. I, I'm not sure where that even is at, versus last year. I, I'm struggling because it's split up into so many different departments. Um, so to be quite honest, I don't want to vote on the budget yet tonight. I, I want to see, I, I, I I can't support budgets that are going to put us over $20. I think we've got major increases in a lot of our departments where everybody likes to blame the schools for our big costs in town, but they've all budgeted pretty well in their single digit low single digit increases as opposed to a lot of our departments. Um, I know some of these are justified, but I think we also have to direct our departments to maybe sharpen their pencils a little bit if, I mean, I don't want, I don't want to get to advisory and then everybody be shocked that we're having a $20 tax rate. We can't just blindly approve our budgets when that could be a major reason that we're going over $20. Good point. Yeah, Paul. I, I concur with the idea of putting off a vote on the budget, but I, I did read it a little bit differently. I thought the $20 was departmental requests but that the advisory recommendation was below twenty dollars, so that um, if we followed what advisory is talking about, we would be, I think, at uh, at nineteen eighty something. Was I don't think one. advisory has made their recommendations. They don't do that until their public hearing. I think well, um, there was a column. That, that's guidance. I think you're looking at the guidance column, and. What the what where we're at right now is budgets are over guidance, so that puts us over twenty. Okay. So that's why I think we may need to dig in a little more and sharpen our pencils. Okay, so, so I, I say I agree with that notion. And I just had a detailed question to say, uh, and maybe it's for David. Actually, you might know off the top of your head. Um, one of my questions in the budget and. I don't read numbers as good as like George reads numbers or Jeff. And so I just wanted to you know, ask some big picture questions, whatever. Does the police budget include the three new officers or not? 
as recommended by the consult. What? The three sergeants, or are you talking about the dispatcher? No, those three new positions. I want to say it was one dispatcher, two officers, or vice versa, something like that. Yeah. So we, we recommended seven. We authorized four last year, and we're going to split it to three this year. Does this include the three? Those are in there, yeah. yeah. Okay. Because you see a 7% increase in salaries, and I assume that's yeah. why. Yeah. And, uh, I also know it was new union contracts. I wasn't sure how much that affected either, to be honest with you. I, but, I actually don't think the three are in there. We can check later. Yeah, because that's something which I think, because it took us a while to fill the four, and I don't think they ever got fully got filled. filled. And frankly, you know, the consultant's recommendation of set seven was a big chunk. That was like 30% increase, 40% increase. I, One of my ideas was to see how we do with the four for like an extra year, fully for it, fully staff it, get the new chief, and then maybe, you know, defer the three new positions, uh, not this year, but into next year. And I, I want, you know, obviously um, Bento to be here to discuss. I don't know if he's on the he call. Just, he, oh, there just, he, is. He's he just reappeared. I'm still here. I just wanted to say that does include those positions. Does uh, it? Yes. My mistake. I'm sorry. No, that's, that's okay. okay. I, I had put those in because I, I was under the impression that um, the plan was to do four in FY21, three in FY22. Uh, Sharon actually did a pretty uh, extensive workup to show what would happen if we don't add those three, where basically we would reduce the personnel cost, but then the overtime cost would go back up. So that was a conversation we had. And then the last meeting we had, um, uh, Mr. Dorentz has asked me to take another hard look at the overtime as far as the training because of what's coming down the road with the police reform. And, and my response was, I think with the additional officers, we can do a lot of that training on regular time. So I think if the positions get cut, then that also is gonna increase the overtime because again, to maintain the certification and do all that mandated training, it's gonna bump the overtime number again. So that's why I left it the way it was with those, okay. those three positions. Yeah, I'd like to see that analysis definitely because I always thought the seven was just a big number to increase and it'd be nice to kind of feel it out for a year because we just, it's going to take a year to, you know, by the time you put, the, through, put people to academy to get like boots on the ground of all four people. And I think that's about what it took. And even then, I think we, we just filled a couple positions. So, I mean, that's something at least I would like to at least open for a dialogue and see Sharon, mm -hmm. Sharon's analysis. I get the OT thing, but just that, again, it was such a seven, such a large percentage increase. I feel as I'd like to at least consider a year rest before doing the second wave of three. I don't know if there's any thoughts on the board. Yeah, I agree with you, Eric. The, the other thing, like I mentioned, um, not on the police, but I'd like to see a roll up of the DPW. I don't, I look at those budgets and the, I know there's some line items moving from category to category. So I don't see what the total, I don't know where to look to find where the total DPW budget is. Deb, can you do a roll up like a, a cost center or? It, she has one. It's in the VADAR report, I think. It's it's not right. in the model. It's not in the model, but I think there's a VADAR report that there, there I'm, is. I'm it. looking at like the stuff that was sent to us by Diane when she sent the packet. And there's the all the different, there's like five different DPW. There's like DPW administration, and then there's yeah. high and then there's snow and ice, street yeah. vehicle maintenance. Yeah. LM. There, there, is, there is a VADAR report that can summarize all that and put it into one lump sum number. Okay, Sharon. great. Sharon sent an email, a separate one, with the model and the VADA reports. Oh, okay. So it's in the Sharon. It's in the Sharon. It's in a Sharon uh, email, not the one from Diane. Correct, correct. Okay. But the departments are the way we used to always do it because DP. It actually wasn't called DPW, CMD, because it used to be all those various departments that they mm -hmm. jumbled together. And whenever it was Paul, 1989 or whenever that was. So there's a road department, you know, highway. You know, there's all different departments, snow and ice. Land management. Yeah, exactly. All right. Are there any kind of broad-based questions like that? I think it's at least we have an agenda item. You know, I, I got yeah. that my question. Uh, George, did you say yes? Uh, yeah, I just want that DP. If we could get that DPW, just a summary of the DPW before our next meeting, I'd love to see that. I, I'm, I'm searching through emails right now, but I would love if somebody could specifically send that to me in a separate email and say, this is the DPW roll up. <laughs> yeah, I can get that to you. Okay, thank you. I think DPW, just a whole list, just thinking about a big picture, they got th um, three long-term people retired in the last year or so, um, kind of filled it up with kind of people earlier in their career. It feels like the um, salary situation shouldn't be any worse than it was. Right, and that's why, and that's why I want to, I just can't get a good picture of it the way it's all separated out by the department. So 
by looking at a roll up, we can get a better idea of where the budget is as a whole. Yeah, remember tree costs are up a little bit. And mm -hmm. also, um, I'm not sure what, how the transfer station shows up, but as you know, you know we're not getting recycling money now. because No, that's like, separate. I, I would consider the transfer separate. station a separate budget. I think that's separate, yeah. yeah. But that could possibly be higher because of the problem every community is having with it. Yeah. Eric, Wendy Alassie has her hand up. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, please, Wendy, go ahead. Uh, yes, so I don't want to speak out of turn, but I did want to let you know that I had um, an hour long conversation um, with Stephen Sai today. And um, he did say that he felt comfortable. It was the 0.88 overall budget increase. Um, and, you know, not including the um, COLA. Um, and we did talk and in the budget model, there were some items that could impact that $20 rate. Um, originally it was reported the highest at $20.09. And then um, the budget that came through this morning was $20.02. So we did talk, I gave them a, some additional numbers and we are feeling a little bit better that we may be able to stay under the $20 mark. Yeah, that's still a big increase. It's huge, I agree. So, so I almost I wanna, threw up. <laughs> I, wanna, I wanna really dig in as much as we yes. on the budgets that we control. Uh, yes. Our responsibility to the town to at least look at those and see if there's anywhere that we can help. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. But just to add a little, little bit of um, okay. insight. Okay. Okay, yeah, very good. Any other uh, least questions on the board? Broad base, I think on, on, uh, on the budget itself, we'll actually I'll reconvene on this. And um, you know, I was talking to Diane, sorry, I didn't put you in the spot. I guess some other numbers rolled in that's uh, a little bit more up to date than what's in our packet. And uh, perhaps then we'll be able to get a better detailed view and people can actually approach um, whomever at town hall to get some more um, detailed information. Uh, one number right. that's also higher is the library is higher only because this is the first year we're planning to budget to have a full new library. You know, every year we budgeted for a portion of the new library and a portion of the, you know, temporary one. This mm -hmm. year we'll have a higher cost of the full new library, but um, the library is donating. They voted the other night $62,000 from trustees operating uh, funds to they contribute to the operating budget. That's good. Okay. I saw John Paul had his hand up, physical hand. Well, I was just going to comment that uh, for this meeting, a lot of material was delivered very late. Like the warrant was at 5.36 for a meeting that was starting at 6.30. I didn't get a chance to see it. There were bits and pieces that um, just came late. And so the when you've got pages and pages of numbers and you're trying to make sense out of them, I understand George's point perfectly that that does you, you we need more time to react to stuff than just getting them so late in the process. I would urge first that stuff be given us to us earlier, but if it does you can't if that can't be helped that then we don't just jump at approving things right away that we have a chance to everybody review it and study it make sure we know we had we had our email from diane on tuesday with our final packet and since then i think we've gotten about 20 more emails with documents and it's just very confusing that's correct find yep. exactly what we're what the latest information is that we're supposed to be considering yep. i think I think all these follow-up emails make everything very cluttered. Yeah, so maybe we get a- and I, and I understand things are changing on a day-to-day -day basis. So a lot has changed since Tuesday and, and, and people are trying to get us the latest information, but it's hard that it's hard because we're probably all looking at different versions of, of things when we come to this meeting on Thursday night. Yeah, so, just like the, the discussion about the, the Laurel Fields, I was looking at a warrant that had no article. And then I guess David just sent me a copy of something that was sent like at five o'clock that, that did have an article. And so I feel like I was 
talking about something that was already already fixed and just wasting everybody's time because I didn't have the latest version. So if we push this off to the two weeks from now, which would be the, um, what do you call it? Uh, then, you know, next meeting, um, do you think that I uh, maybe, um, Alice, David and Diane, do you think that uh, we'll have whatever final information enough to, you know, a good week ahead of time? Okay. I think so, partly because, uh, you know, we have the advisory public hearing shortly after our meeting two weeks from now, so they got to right. be pretty nailed down to be ready for the advisory hearing, too. How do we look at our next agenda? Just, you know, um, behind the scenes, I, um, Diane and I talked about actually deferring some of the stuff. We didn't. I decided to make a more loaded meeting tonight a little bit because if you kick things out, it keeps making it loaded. So I imagine our next meeting doesn't look too, too bad, does it? Uh, not at this point, Eric. So if you just kind of talk about the... It's not too bad. It won't be late tonight. What's that? Let's try to keep it that way so we can really have an in-depth discussion on budgets and and if items that can be pushed off, I think we've really got to focus on the items at hand with the budget and the warrant and get those things finalized at our next meeting. Okay. We'll definitely have the ominous budget and obviously the turf field will be two major items. Absolutely. Well, and and if we need to open the warrant, at our next meeting. That's right. We'll see a check with We got we'll to make sure that's that's taken care of as well. We know we have to because like that Upper Charles Trail connectors. Run, right, right. So. And then I know there's been some discussion. Um, I don't we don't have it on the agenda, but there's been some discussion of whether we need to make any changes to the finance director bylaw before we hire a new finance director. So I think we should have that discussion and decide whether we want to, if we have the warrant open, if we need to have a warrant article for that. Which puts us right into the next agenda, item number six. So might as well at least do that. Um, discussion of interim finance director. Um, as you know, the current finance director, Sharon McPherson, is leaving, um, retiring April 2nd. Um, there is an appointed assistant town accountant with the, all the authority uh, that the finance director has. So we've, um, you know, the operations will continue however long you need um, to talk about these things. But the, the things that I need to know is, um, do you want a hiring process for the interim or do we just continue operations as we're doing and go right to a permanent? And then if we are going to a permanent, um, and we're talking about changing the bylaw, I don't really wanna do anything with the permanent position until after yeah. that. So, um, you know, we're structured right now that we can continue operations with just uh, having a couple of resources to go to, like an outside VADAR person and um, another firm that, um, you know, as a retired finance director, she can help us out um, if if we run into something. But as of right now, I don't see anything that that can't be um, um, handled up there. And Deb Seifring, as the assistant, um, is using some extra uh, help from existing staff. You know, a few extra hours to do some things. So there's not an immediate need of, ha of needing an interim person other than the people who are already here. And I would prefer to wait for um, whatever you are going to do with the bylaw and then post it. Um, okay. That makes sense. I think we need to have a discussion at our next meeting of if we're going to make any changes to the bylaw before we consider hiring somebody permanent. And if you think things can run on an interim basis, um, the way they are, then, then unless anybody else has thinks that that doesn't work, um, I don't. I think we should kind of stick with the interim until we get the bylaw figured out, so we know. No, I don't want to put a job posting out there and then have it change. So I think we should wait. Yeah, yeah. Deb Seifring as the assistant town accountant is. Um, she's had her CPA in uh, Ohio. She's very qualified. She's been with the town a long time. Um, no issues. She's on the phone tonight if you wanted to ask her any questions. But. So do we need a motion mm -hmm. to appoint her as interim? Okay. So I think the bylaw automatically. The bylaw requires you to appoint an interim 
within 60 days after the vacancy. So you're talking April, May, June, the end of June before you would be violating you know, the bylaw if you don't appoint um, as an interim. I plan to consider um, the assistant town accountant as the acting uh, as the acting finance director as soon as the existing finance director vacates the position. And I think that that's enough without needing a formal appointment from in accordance with the bylaw okay. until you have time to look at the position. Yeah, I don't think we need to point. I don't think we need to do anything tonight on that. Yeah, and if we're not having a special hiring process for an interim, I don't. I on the on the um, will we have the personnel board advise us on the um, finance director requirements or no? What who would who would be the one advising us on that? I mean, the personnel board approved the job description, so that's it. They wouldn't. There's an existing job description. Um, if there was but, something, but in terms of the bylaw, I mean, would they have no review of the bylaw, really? No, um, no. It really is specific. It just says that the select board needs to appoint an interim within sixty days. No, so, I, think, no I meant more generally. I think than just yeah. that. I think my issue with the bylaw is the reporting, and I think because I think as a volunteer board. <laughs> we're not the best supervisors. And I think we should be looking at whether the finance director should be reporting to the town administrator. Yeah. So there's good reason why that's- I know Paul, yeah, I, I know it's, yeah. It's right. checks and balances. Right, but we have that, that as well between the treasurer and I, I just, I think we need, um, we have a town administrator. You know, I, I look at it, Paul, as we're the board of directors and the town administrators are CEO. How many companies have employees direct, reporting directly to the board of directors? Usually, you know, the CEO, the way the chart flows, the CEO is managing the different departments. And I think that includes the finance department, the police department, the fire department, and the DPW. So I think that structure makes more sense to me logically because we're all volunteers. We all have full-time jobs. We're not prepared to supervise a department. For some reason, it makes sense to all of us, but it didn't make sense to the governance and uh, town meetings. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm thinking of something that ha takes that into consideration. And uh, I'll, I mean, I talked to you, well, I told you, George, that I would look at that to see what um, what we could do now without, you know, having to open the whole bylaw up for mm -hmm. changes. And uh, I'll I'll get that to you. Okay. Yeah. As long as we have it before our next meeting, so we can think about it. Yeah. I'll. Yeah. But I would like to have that discussion with some background materials next meeting. Background on. Um, like you said, you're gonna you're gonna look at. You just said you're gonna look into it. Yeah, yeah. It's it's my take on it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I guess no actions needed at this time. Uh, seems like uh, things are covered in the short term, and I, I, you know, I agree. We do need to at least at least relook at the um, at the bylaw. I don't know if there's another way. I get what Paul says about some of the independence. You know what I mean? And in there, I think it's some corporations, CFOs are separate from CEOs, actually. Um, but I also get that you can't have someone just, you know, go straight to this board. But we have, Sherbin is funny with all the elected um, elected working people, you know, staff that's actually elected, kind of has people that don't fall under the town administrator anyway. So I think it's worth looking at. Anyways, um, okay, that's enough of that agenda item. Uh, consideration routine business. Are there any uh, select board reports? Right there. Uh, I don't know if Jeff is anything with the with the goals. I haven't uh, posted it yet, but I haven't changed it either. Okay. But we are making progress on some, <laughs> so that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's true. That's a good, very, very good point. I mean, I'm very pleased with the police chief search having ten candidates or something like that, and yep. making yeah. progress there. So. Yeah, I guess yeah. I could give an update on that as the chair of the police search committee. We have. We've gotten a good pool of applicants. 
um, which so we're making progress on that and um, looking forward to you know digging in with our consultant as as to what these applicants look like. But from what the sounds of it, we've got some strong applicants for the position. Mm -hmm. Yep, so I heard. Um, how about uh, David? Do you have any town administrator reports? Um, just uh, two things. One is uh, from Tri County Regional Voc um, School. Uh, there is some. There was an increase in some spending. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, increase in uh, some funding that they're going to get from elementary and secondary education emergency relief program. So uh, Sherburn's portion of that is for FY22 is $523, but they need um, the selectmen to actually um, affirm using that 523 to reduce our assessment for next year. So, um, so I moved. Okay. All <laughs> <laughs> oh, always takes deposits. <laughs> yeah. It's a take your money. Always take money when someone gives it to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I agree. Unless it's a, uh, a print, some prints that send you an email, right? Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. The Nigerian prince. Yeah, Nigerian prince, exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, I did. I just want to mention that for the finance director, I did um, advert put an advertisement. Not really an advertisement. A notice of impending vacancy. Um, posted it on LinkedIn just so I could get some sort of feel of the market on how many finance people are out there actually. Um, you know, interested in the position. So, um, you know, I'll keep that up and um, maybe by the time we post it, I'll, we'll have a good idea on, on what the uh, market is for those people. Last time we didn't have one applicant that had any municipal experience. So, um, you know, it needed, you know, Sharon had to have a learning curve and she did great. Um, do we need a consultant to do the hiring? Yeah. No, unless you want one. I, I can bring in um, Mary Beth Bernard that we use for the COA director. Uh, that's short money, but um, I don't think we're at that point yet. Yeah, let's let's figure out the position first, and then decide if we want to. And maybe David will have a better idea after he sees the interest out there um, and then make a decision. Yeah, so those are the only two things I had. Okay, very good. All right, uh, no further ado, um, we can close the uh, open session and go into executive session per the agenda. Do we have an other, I thought we did the executive. We actually did. So we actually have a repetitive, we have two, we basically have, um, the repetitive one for the library. So if you wanted to re-talk about the opportunity to do it, to do it, because it is on the agenda, I don't think there's anything else to say. And it's also a thing about the uh, the minutes. Oh, is that on? The, I didn't see that on the page two. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, sorry. I know it's late, but you know it's an opportunity to get something done. Yep. Okay. Well, we did well to get to nine forty. That I thought was going to be later than that. No, I know. I, I will tell you, though, that when we go to executive session, I'm going to ask for a five minute break. Good. Okay. okay. And good night, all. <laughs> good night, Bye, Susie. Susie. See you later. Good night, guys. Night. night. All right. I'll make a motion. Do you need to do that? I think I need to do it, actually. Yeah. That's right. Um, I move that we um, exit open session and go into executive session uh, for the agenda items as aforementioned um, by the uh, uh, by the time as read by the town administrator and as chair I declare that an executive session is warranted is there a second second all right all in favor George aye Jeff aye Paul aye I am I as well okay we can turn off the recording and I'm going to ask this for a few minutes <laughs>